Uh, good morning, and welcome back to day two of the Community and Public Services Committee meeting. I'll start by acknowledging that this place where we are gathered today is the traditional land of Treaty 6 territory, and we thank the diverse Indigenous peoples whose ancestors' footsteps have marked this territory for centuries, including the Cree, the Dene, the Sotu, the Nakota Sioux, and the Blackfoot peoples. We also acknowledge this as the Métis homeland and the home of the largest concentration of Inuit south of the 60th parallel. I'll start with the roll call of committee. First of all, Councillor Jans. Good morning. Good morning, Councillor Wright. Good morning. Good morning. Councillor Tang. Good morning, and I hear it echo. Yeah, we're working on it. Oh, yeah. I don't. Uh, Mayor Sohi will be arriving in a few moments. He's been delayed uh, on city business, I will hasten to add. Uh, who else do we have with us from council today? Councillor Knack. Good morning. Good morning, hope you're feeling better. Uh, Councillor Rutherford. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Councillor Principe. Good morning. And I think that's it for the moment. Sure, we'll be joined by others as the day goes on. So we will resume questions of administration and questions of the mover uh, of the motion on the floor pertaining to item. Uh, it was the Walker. Was it 6.6? 6.6. Uh, do we have the speakers list from yesterday? There were still a few. We're yep. going to put it up. Okay. There we go. So next on our, oh, next on our list was me. Isn't that interesting? Um, now I have to remember my questions from, what was that, six hours ago. I was so focused on getting the meeting started that I forgot my questions. I'll move on and see if they come back to mind. Uh, Councillor Stevenson is not uh, here with us presently. I know she's bouncing back between two meetings. So we'll go to Councillor Wright. Okay, um, I've got to get my head wrapped around this again. Um, I guess to administration on the cost, just looking through, whoops, I'm just going to grab my notes here. Okay, in the report it says that the previously approved funding of 5.6 million um, was for the land acquisition and then further down in the report it says that the land was acquired between 2019 and 2021. So I, I just want some clarity around that I guess. Do we have the land already or not? I Sorry, was uh, that for yeah. Walker? Yes. Okay. So Councillor Wright, I can, I can speak to that. We do have the land um, and I apologize, I have to look back, look back in the report but if it said it was acquired in uh, 2019, that's not correct. Um, we've been working over that time to acquire land, looking, working with developers, and ended up being able to take advantage of some city surplus land that I believe tra Transit had. Um, so we have secured that land, and that really just was finalized maybe the end of 21, but yeah, probably end of 2021, early 2022. So we do have the land secured for that. So secured or paid for? Uh, secured is we're it's going to be only it's only going to cost a dollar. So because it's an internal transfer, and although times we do pay for the full price of the land in this one, uh, the essentially the land was transferred to to this project. Okay, so the full five point six million then is being used for the concept development and design. Correct, to bring it to a point where it can be brought back to council with an accurate um, you know, funding estimate. 
the requirement. Okay. And I think Councillor Cartmel yesterday had mentioned something that that seems pretty excessive for. Uh, yeah, well, I would let other. maybe IIS speak to the cost of uh, the costs. Uh, Councillor Wright, can I ask if your question is about the 5.6 million or the total cost of the project? Do you know the total cost of the project? It's identified in the uh, business case that uh, at checkpoint one, which is a very high level estimate. So. And what is that? Just so I don't have to look for it. Uh, it's $55 million. So, so I guess my question is, I, I would just wanted to make sure to answer your question. Are you talking about excessive costs related to the planning and design estimate that's being provided or for the total cost estimate? Um, maybe I'll refer to Councillor Cartmel because he was the one who mentioned it yesterday and maybe he can delve into that further with his questioning. Okay, thank you. That's all I had. Uh, thank you, Councillor Principe. Thank you, Mr. Chair. My question is uh, in relation to attachment one of 6.6. .6. It says uh, city policy C601 provides that an aspirational target of 16% affordable housing for all neighborhoods. Um, I'm just a little bit confused about the word aspirational in the sentence. Does that mean that that is a goal that we are trying to attain? And uh, are we able to attain that goal? That, uh, that's correct, uh, Councillor Principe. When the goal was adopted by Council at the time, it was acknowledged that to achieve the vision of having um, sufficient affordable housing to meet all the needs and also be, have that spread equitably across all neighbourhoods would be a long-term and aspirational vision. But the 16% is guidance that we use for the purposes of implementing policy C601, which means when we're reviewing investment decisions, whether that be um, purchasing a piece of land or providing a grant to a partner, we consider the percentage of affordable housing already available in that neighborhood and the surrounding neighborhoods adjacent to it and use that information to um, weigh the option presented to us. So if a neighborhood is already approaching 16% or over 16%, then um, we're obviously less um, interested in investing more in that area. Um, unless there's extenuating circumstances or something else that might warrant it. But in general, we try to um, ensure that the city, when the city is leading the investment, it is in areas of the city that are not already well served by affordable housing. Okay, that's great. So it's not just aspirational, it's something that you are working on. So that's great to hear. That was my only question. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Rutherford. Yes, thank you. Uh, just with regards to my understanding of this motion. So for changing the scope, there's no budgetary impact now, but are we pre-committing then when it comes back in 2024? That's what I'm trying to understand. Uh, Councillor, uh, based on the, um, the the project development and delivery uh, model and the uh, policy on capital project governance, you're not pre-committing beyond uh, the funding that you're awarding or that would be reallocated to this project, so the 5.6. When the project comes back, when it's ready for construction funding or delivery funding, it would be up to council to uh, fund it at, this, at that time or to, um, to put it on the shelf uh, until funding is ready. So I guess my concern there is if it comes back and the cost per unit for the affordable housing spaces is, is really high, does it put the fire station on the shelf too? That's something that we can look at as we're uh, working through the design. Um, phase construction would have uh, an additional cost potentially, but there are things that we can do during the design that could uh, allow us to uh, develop the site uh, in uh, different um, at different moments in time. Yeah. And so it's something that we can review to allow for options. Yeah, I, I, I think that would be the only way I'd be comfortable with this motion on the floor because I know the importance of having that fire station from a safety and service delivery perspective. And so I wouldn't want that to be at risk if the cost of the affordable housing is something that is too, too steep when it comes back. So just confirming that you can, in fact, consider that in the planning. 
We can consider it in the planning. Uh, we will see uh, what the options might look like and what costs could be associated with those options. And we'll be ready to share that with um, council at checkpoint three when we're ready to request additional funding. Okay, I appreciate that. Thank you for that clarification. That's all my questions. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Tang. Oh, just to close, so. Oh, okay. Uh, and I don't don't know that Councillor Stevenson is with us. I'll just check. I don't see her on our attendee list. Um, okay. So, seeing no other questions, then um, from councillors on this motion. Uh, there's several other motions coming, but questions will be limited primarily to the subject matter of those subsequent motions. So if there's any further questions on the presentation or on the, the bundle of reports generally, uh, now would be the time to ask them. So I'll just uh, make one more call for questions just to be particularly careful and not seeing then any. So we have a motion on the floor. Um, Anyone caring to speak to the motion? Not seeing any then, uh, Councillor Tang to close. Great, thank you. Um, you know, I wanna thank all the community members who have reached out about this project to me personally and share their thoughts. I wanna thank administration for advancing this project. You know, housing and homelessness is no longer just a downtown or core issue. Uh, we're seeing encampments on the deep south side, people sleeping behind parks and bus shelters in Mill Woods, panhandlers along stretches of main corridor roads. And some of them are provisionally housed through motels and whatnot, but many of them are not, and uh, find themselves in communities that don't have the services to support them um, and the complex challenges that they face. And we've talked at length at council about all of this and finding ways to build communities. So. I think this integrated fire station project fills a lot of those gaps, not only in providing a much needed fire service in the southeast, but leveraging this opportunity to co-locate housing and medical services um, and fulfilling our commitment to a distributed approach to, to servicing. It's an opportunity to strengthen our community and help to improve community safety and well-being through the much needed civic services. I can appreciate that there's a lot of concern about the limited engagement when it comes to the scope of change. Uh, and I think moving forward, engaging with residents, members of local community organizations and leagues and business uh, businesses is something that I, I will, you know, I am committed to see from administration and happy to help out wherever I can. The risk of public receptivity was not mentioned in the report, but I think it is inherent uh, in any project like this, whether we agree with it or not. And the way to mitigate this risk is to get ahead of the conversation. And from a governance perspective, I feel strongly that there more could have been done to, to give people a heads up and, and um, to meet with the in impacted communities and inform them about this change of scope. But all we can do now is move forward and ensure that engagement is done diligently, making room for new neighbors in the community rather than devolving into a discussion of not in my backyard. So I want to make sure we engage neighbors in a fruitful discussion, answer as much questions as possible, that this project has the adequate buy-in, and then the community is set up with the capacity to welcome their new neighbors. And when it comes to costs, you know, I know there is a concern about uh, potentially by, a by the time 2024 rolls around, costs might be even higher, but it also could be a lot lower. Um, and uh, you know, I look forward to that capital profile and for a discussion on um, you know, the feasibility of, of carrying it out. Uh, this could serve as a model for, for, for future uh, co-location, uh, and I'm, I am excited to see where the conversation goes. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Chang. Uh, please vote. I'm a yes. I'm a yes. We'll I'm a yes as well. Thank you. We'll just, we're just opening the vote right now, and we're having a little bit of a technical difficulty in the room, so we don't have it displayed on the screen. Um, if you'd like, I can let you know when the votes are in and we can call the vote that way. So count. And just a reminder that yep. it's, it, 
describes the tools that the clerks use for minutes, so it's really helpful if we can get in there. I know you just got here from there. So. Perfect. With the verbal votes, we have five votes. Okay, I got it. Oh, perfect. Uh, please display the vote. Can we display it? We'll give it a second and see if we can get it up, but it is uh, carried unanimously. Very good. Thank you, then. So, uh, now there are some other motions uh, subsequent to this bundle of reports. So, uh, uh, Mayor Sohi, uh, Councillor Stevenson is in sort of two meetings at once here with police commission duties. So, I'm going to go to you next for your motion, if that's okay. Yep. Absolutely. Uh, I think there was uh, the wording was given uh, uh, to the clerk, and I'm just trying to find it here. Uh, Apologies. Which motion are you looking for? Uh, here we go. I I'll read it. Uh, okay that the Community and Public Services Committee recommend to Council uh, that administration provide a report outlining options to reduce costs and timelines to deliver non-market affordable housing within Edmonton. Consultation with relevant stakeholders should examine developing enhanced customer support, a grant program for permit and consulting fees, opportunities to accelerate the development timelines and possible preemptive rezoning of surplus school sites or other city-owned lands to facilitate and expedite construction. That's the one we have, right? Perfect, yes, we'll get it up on the board there. And just to confirm, I believe this work is currently um, being worked on, so it does not need council approval. Committee can approve this. So it doesn't need to go to council? It does not need to okay, go to council. Got okay, got it. And to, uh, while it's being, uh, Can I make the introduction? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Sure. Yeah. You know, uh, the uh, earlier this year, uh, uh, I held a roundtable discussion with housing providers and uh, uh, and people who serve the houseless population and agencies uh, that work in that area. One and one of the key messages uh, I heard was there are few other opportunities for the city to improve its processes to reduce costs and timelines uh, for developing affordable housing and there are many affordable housing providers, including providers of cooperative housing, were experiencing unexpected uh, uh, cost and delays during permitting, rezoning, and development process that were difficult to manage while still maintaining the affordability of the units being, uh, being developed. And I think this motion will allow us to not only look at that, but also look at uh, some of the other opportunities that other cities are exploring, such as, for, for example, Victoria, is really looking at how do you rezone or, or eliminate some of the barriers around rezoning for affordable housing. So that's the intent, and uh, and the report will come back to us for uh, for further discussion on uh, and how to move forward if you wish to move forward on that. So that's a brief introduction, Mr. Chair. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Mr. Sohi. So, um, Madam Clerk, I'm wondering if we should make this uh, motion uh, essentially the response to item 612. We, we can, can do, do that. that. Oh, okay. Yep. Uh, thank you, Mayor Sohi. Uh, questions to uh, either administration or Mayor Sohi on the motion on the floor? Uh, and I don't have any, so that's a remnant request. Councillor Stevenson, yeah, okay. Yes, thanks very much. Thanks, uh, Mayor Sohi, for, for putting this forward. I think that's, uh, you know, great, great work to be undertaking. Um, just to administration, uh, so, so I understand that uh, some of our permitting fees can already be recouped through our grant programs. Is is that correct? Yes, the uh, the grant program is for the total construction cost, and that would also include the development permits fees and also consulting fees. And so we do have the grant program that does uh, cover off those two items today. Okay. Okay. Perfect. Um, and I think I think I, I appreciate the wording around the expedited um, support because I understand that client liaison services are available, but I think there's a bit of lack of clarity about when when they get assigned to a file. So having a more dedicated resource sounds like a really great appro approach. Um, some other areas that I think would be really worth investigating 
we talked uh, in relation to the missing and murdered indigenous women and girls report around uh, committed core stable funding. Right now, a lot of the indigenous housing providers are not able to access those grants because their operating budgets are too large. But I would just say um, having a position that could be dedicated to some of that grant application writing, but also the networking and relationship building, which I think came through really strongly in the indigenous housing framework. That's a key uh, capacity constraint that a lot of organizations have. So I think looking at, at that, a, a core stable funding for a position that would enable that work, I think would be really impactful. Um, another suggestion as well, I noticed that that 10% equity requirement was seen as a barrier for some organizations. I know a challenge with the current grant program is that land assets are not counted as equity if they were donated. So for example, if an indigenous housing group gets land donated through a church, the value of that land could be millions, uh, but they, at least in the past, were not able to, to count that as equity because they didn't pay for it. So is that maybe a, an approach, uh, a shift that could be made? Yeah, we're actually going through that right now with a couple of different uh, bands that are looking to develop in Edmonton. And, and we've, uh, we found a way to help support them without that, that initial equity piece. And so some of that is done through uh, showing that they have other interests that can, that can also work. Uh, a little bit of that is challenged based on, on some of their structures. And so even a couple of weeks ago, we met with, uh, with the band's leadership group to talk about options going forward. And so we, we, uh, we try to find ways to make it work, I guess is the best way to make it. To say yeah. It. Great, great, and I think I think you know other other lending uh, institutions do consider land as as that equity piece. So that could be a, a practice that we can continue to go. I think that I was mistakenly given five minutes. I don't know if I should just run with that, or I can finish my questions. Here. Oh, fresh day. Oh yeah, new motion. Okay, great. Um, well, I might just bounce around then to make best use of my time, and I apologize again to be popping in and out uh, today. Um, but I think, you know, this motion really comes from that conversation that was happening with, with housing providers. For the Indigenous housing strategy, uh, again, really great work. Um, I love, absolutely love the hands-off approach that was taken to developing those recommendations. I think that's a really powerful uh, uh, method that was taken. Um, just wondering, um, in terms of the overall affordable housing strategy as well, I know that some of the nations uh, were listed as uh, stakeholders, but there wasn't necessarily an opportunity to, to follow through with that conversation. Just wondering how, how council can potentially support those discussions uh, to advance that work, whether that's us being part of a delegation that goes to the nations to meet with them. Just wondering if that's a possibility to, to help address that. Uh, thanks for the question, Councillor Stevenson. Yeah, often, we often reach out to a wide range of Indigenous stake led stakeholders in many aspects of our work and sometimes you know we get participa good participation sometimes we don't depending on sort of what's going on and and the the I guess the priority that's put on it um, I think when we're working on our new strategy and our refresh obviously um, participation is really key and so we can talk to um, Jamie and our IRO and see if there's some strategies that we can work on together where bringing um, you know leveraging the political side as well as the administrative side um, might lead to more fruitful discussions and certainly we do hear that sometimes when we're engaging with um, First Nations the appreciation for having that political to political relationship in addition to um, the admin to admin relationship. And so we can absolutely work with our Indigenous Relations Office to come up with an engagement strategy that makes sense for our strategy research, refresh in that regard. Great, yeah, I think really prioritizing those MOU relationships and then yeah, whatever we can do to support would be great. Thank you so much. Thank you, so um, I guess my question on this motion is, and just going back to the, the presentation, uh, is this work you were going to be doing anyway? Or is this, is this properly added of this motion? I would offer that a lot of this work is already underway. Is there a way to, for continuous improvement, uh, a greater focus on red tape reduction, and are there nuances of, of things that we could, um, you know, having that been flagged here, that we can pursue? Absolutely. I, I'm just, I'm, I'm a little concerned that this calls to generate a report which in a way is already being generated and work that's already being done. So um, if, this, if this motion is helpful, great, but if it's, if it's making work, not great. We really, really appreciate your concern in that regard, but I, w I will say that because this 
was identified by the stakeholders and I attended the round table that the mayor um, hosted. Yeah. You know, if it's important to them, it should be important to us, I think, and we wanna make sure that we are um, meeting, you know, meeting their expectations also because they are such key partners and we can't do any of this affordable housing work without our nonprofit partners. So I think it is worth, um, you know, rolling it up at least for a discussion and giving the opportunity to examine the issues, even though I think a lot of this, to Councilor Stevens' point and, and what's been mentioned previously, is work already underway. You know, writing it down and systematizing it um, could be something that comes out of this report. And so I think we're in support of, yeah, of providing the information. Okay, thank you. That, that answers my question. I appreciate that. Uh, Councillor Principe. Thank you, Mr. Chair. My, my concern with this um, motion is that the possible preemptive rezoning of surplus school sites, uh, simply because uh, you look in certain wards, they will have more surplus school sites than other wards. For example, one in my ward currently that's for sale is right across the street from um, affordable housing. So my concern is that we're going to saturate certain neighborhoods. And then an example is the annexed areas on the south side that would not have any surplus school sites would not be preemptively zoned for affordable housing. So how can we ensure that balance of that 16% affordable housing for all neighborhoods if this motion passes? Um, well, so I can, uh, is that to me the question to administration, Council President? Yeah, yeah, sorry, that was to administration. So with the motion would just be bringing back information so no decisions would be made. Um, and it, some of that information would include how engagement would be considered or not considered given the, if with respect to pre-zoning, I think the intent um, from the providers is mostly that it's pre-zoned from their perspective. So when they're getting it, it's already zoned, but that doesn't necessarily mean that engagement hasn't happened. It would just be city-led instead. But we could we could bring back, like this report would be bringing back information about the process. It wouldn't be directing us to engage in that process. Um, okay. <laughs> Maybe Councilor Principe, one other thing I'll just reference that might be helpful is the reason that uh, is city council's already made decisions to make those sites available for affordable housing through um, a city policies that were passed. So whether so we wouldn't be doing sort of a new analysis of whether or not that site is appropriate for housing because that decision has already been made by city council and it's codified in city policy. Okay, and so how are we ensuring that again that some neighborhoods are not being saturated? and other neighborhoods so, are so, being untouched. Sure, so I mean, we, I mean, and we're happy to look at the percentage in any neighborhood that might be of concern, uh, Council Principe, but the 16% was direction provided by Council on a go forward basis. So when that was approved in 2018, that shapes the decisions going forward from that point on. Um, the decisions around sur allocating surplus school sites for housing were made prior to 2018. Okay, good, thank you, that's my question. So there's nobody else on the board, so maybe I'll follow up on that. So the, essentially this, the, the talk of preemptive zoning, which is perhaps language that might be triggering to some, um, is really truing up the zoning with the policy that's already in place for those sites. Is that, would that be a fair characterization? Yeah. Uh, yes, and I think Ms. Petra's on the line too, but I, that's the way that we would see it for sure. And the. And the motion also mentions other city-owned lands. So in terms of, of um, uh, distributing opportunities across all neighborhoods, there's other city-owned land opportunities that might come into play here as well. Yes, that's correct. Yeah. Okay. We do take approach similar to this on some of, on our surplus school sites, um, where the city led sort of that effort on engagement and pre-zoning before the site's transferred to the operator. So it's not, um, I think what, the providers are asking us to look at is doing that across our portfolio and not just in, with respect to supportive housing. So uh, maybe let me ask it this way. So when we've done these things, we've we've made the policy choice. We've gone down the road of, of um, retaining, uh, of accepting offers, of essentially uh, accepting offers, and then gone to the rezoning process. It sounds like what's being asked for is the rezoning process happens first before we go out for expressions of interest or getting into the contractual arrangements. Is that... That's correct, say. yeah. Um, so I, and that makes some sense because otherwise there's a, the, a risk imperative on the part of the proponent that it, this might work, this might not, but you know, if there's gonna be a, a rezoning conversation. 
I guess the, the part of it that I'm concerned about the, the, is the preemptive phrase because that's what was done in the very first batch of surplus school sites back in 2006. And there's still some simmering uh, angst in some neighborhoods about that. For sure, and that's, I mean, it, that was done via regulation by the, pro, a, a regulatory change by, by the minister, council. exactly, yeah. in order and council. So yeah. I'm not sure that that's on the table in terms of the city's, what the city controls. So when we're looking at the scope of what the city can control with respect to this, I'm, I don't think that that would be an option at this point. Right, so yeah, so let, yeah, just to be clear, we're not looking at uh, <laughs> uh, asking for an order in council to preemptive zone things. We're looking at following our processes just in a, in a different sequence. That's correct. Right. Yeah, okay. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Jans, questions? Uh, can I speak to this one? Once we're done questions, but I don't see anybody else on, so. So go ahead, speak okay. to the motion. Um, I think this is a really good motion and I think it's really timely. We have uh, a lot of city-owned land. We have a lot of uh, sites that could be primed for mixed-use development that I, I think of this little strip mall that we have that uh, that easily could become a affordable housing, six story in a nice area close to transit. I think of uh, some of the surplus sites and we heard recently from a meeting with um, uh, some of the local school trustees about the desire for coordinated real estate strategy. Why I think this uh, motion is really timely and important is that it'll bring it out to the public and it'll allow us to have this conversation at uh, the council table that I think is is vital. I think we, uh, I know there's a lot of work going on behind the scenes with administration, but I think we need to shine a light on this early in the process to bring the community along with us. It, uh, we, you know, when we look at city plan and we look at our objectives and we look at our, our climate emergency, our affordable housing crisis, uh, the 21% the rent increase that Calgary saw due to partially a supply shortage, uh, this can't wait and, and the more we, uh, the more we can bring the public with us, uh, the better. So I commend the mayor on bringing this forward and the partners that we're going to engage in the process as well. So thank you. Thank you to administration for the work ahead. Thank you. Anybody else wishing to speak? Councilor, uh, Mayor Sohi, to close? Yeah. Keep demoting you, I'm sorry. No worries. <laughs> uh, you know, I, uh, first of all, I want to thank our administration for uh, uh, both in the housing area and also in the uh, in the planning and economy area for uh, really improving the process for development and approvals I, we are the uh, the second best city now when it comes to uh, permit approvals and development approvals which is very good and we also worked hard to reduce some of the red tape and uh, uh, saved uh, the industry close to I think four million dollars in, uh, uh, in in the time they saved and that's absolutely helps with the market housing uh, and some of that does do help with the non-market housing as well so I want to commend that work and acknowledge that work you know we are in um, you know, facing a serious crisis uh, in, in affordable housing when one in seventh Edmonton households are struggling to uh, to find a decent place to call home. We should all be worried about it and we should all explore every option that is available to us uh, to, uh, to close that gap. And this motion will allow us to explore some of the things that we can do as a municipality uh, and uh, leverage what we own uh, and facilitate the construction uh, and, uh, and, uh, uh, and market availability and create more, bring more supply into uh, into affordable housing. Uh, I think we need to demonstrate to other orders of government that we are doing all, we are exploring all the tools that are in our toolkit. Uh, that be, helps with our advocacy uh, with the province and the federal government because they also need to step up as well, right? So I think this motion will allow us to uh, have a report that will uh, give, give us options to uh, reduce those costs and timelines as well as uh, accelerate some of the uh, work that needs to be done on um, on, on, on some of the zoning uh, zoning requirements. Yeah, so that's the intent, uh, Mr. Chair, and I'll stop you. Okay, thank you, Mayor Sohi. Please vote. We have five votes. Please display the vote. 
That is carried. Uh, next, we'll go to Councillor Jans for motion on 613. Uh, thank you. I'm just pulling up the text here, unless it's been changed. On behalf of Councillor Stevenson, I would like to move that administration bring forward an unfunded service package as part of the 2023-2026 budget process to make funds available for an affordable housing grant program starting in 2023. Um, that uh, administration returned to executive committee with a report that considers possible municipal property tax relief for the 2021 and 2022 taxation years on the basis of providing affordable housing services for the following accounts. And I'll look to the clerk. Do you have a copy of this wording from the councillor? I believe I do. I do have two separate motions though. Can we, maybe we can put them together as, because I've got some bullets now I was gonna read out. Okay, we okay. can put them all together. Okay, um, Nova Plaza, uh, account 4904553, the Sands Hotel. Do I need to read the entirety of the? Just read the names. Okay, Nova Plaza, the Sands Hotel, Omamu Wango Gamek, uh, Betty Farrell House, Westwood, Bristol Bay, Prairie Manor, Glenwood 1, Glenwood 2, Glenwood 3, uh, JPHW 97th Street, JPHW 85th Street. So we'll just wait for that to come up on the board it's and on its uh, way. offer that that is a two part motion to the clerk. It's just loading. And by way of introduction, I'll note that this is just to get information, not to approve the relief for these properties. Uh, the context is that many of these have fallen into the gap between the old taxation regime, sorry, the old tax exemption regime and the new grant process. And I'm not sure if I can defer to Councillor Stevenson for comments or I'll just remove myself now and she can speak. Uh, yeah, go ahead, Councillor Stevenson. Any opening comments, I suppose? I, I'm, Councillor Jans really ha uh, covered that off very, very well. So this motion is just to uh, put the grant uh, process that is outlined in 613 um, into place to get an unfunded service package for our consideration at the fall budget. Um, and again, as, as Councillor Jans mentioned, there are a number of properties that were anticipating tax exemptions based on the previous approach that the city had applied. Uh, they came into operations in 2021 and 2022 and faced unexpected property tax bills for that time. Um, so this, and, and those properties would likely be eligible properties uh, when the grant, if and when the grant gets put in place. So this would just help bridge that gap for those organizations uh, and buildings that are providing some very, very critical housing in our community, including permanent supportive housing and bridge housing. Uh, thank you. Questions to the mover or to administration on the motion? Uh, Mayor Sohi? Yeah, to administration. Uh, I, I'm just trying to understand why is it taking this long? Uh, because we heard from uh, these uh, uh, housing providers a number of months ago about uh, the challenges they're facing related to uh, the changes that were made. Uh, and we had a lengthy discussion around whether to exempt taxes or to create a grant in lieu. Uh, so I'm just trying to figure it out, like why is it not something that has not been already in the works? Sorry, Mayor Sohi, are you asking about the, exempt, the grant program or are you asking about the tax cancellation within the Well, motion? let's start with the tax cancellation first, right? Uh, why a motion would be needed when we heard from, uh, or motion was required at that time or the motion wasn't made? Yeah, so when we had this conversation originally, there was a request for administration to go back and prepare a grant program, which required us to do some consultation with the providers and develop criteria. So that's what we brought before you as part of this report. So that's the, the long-term plan. That's the yeah. long-term. The yeah. cancellation within the short term really depended on knowing which properties were asking for that relief. And so that ultimately requires a motion from council and okay. we awaited that motion, worked with you know, worked with the providers and with uh, Councillor Stevenson to, to prepare it, but this is when the motions come forward. Okay, so report will come to executive committee I'm just concerned about the burden that uh, these housing providers are carrying until they get certainty around what 
committee will decide. And even for the future, I thought there was a good discussion and uh, some consensus that we e either that we were choosing the grant model, which you're suggesting. But my concern is about the the time lag and delay in uh, and and the impact that will have on these housing providers. That's my well, concern. Yeah, Splitting out the, the two questions, so when it comes to the tax cancellation side of things, generally speaking, you know, we always recommend to providers when they're requesting tax relief from council in this kind of a way, okay. that they do pay their taxes up front, and if cancellation is offered subsequently, that refunds will be provided. So there is a bit of a carrying cost there, and unfortunately, there is a bit of a, a timing issue okay. uh, between when the motion was made. But on the grant side, uh, the grant or the exemption, as was discussed earlier this year, would have been effective starting 2023 regardless. So oh, I see. Okay. Uh, Got it. the fact that we're taking a little bit of additional time still means it's still effective in 2023. Although, again, I have to sort of just be clear, it's contingent on finding funding within the upcoming operating budget. And the, the budget ask is not insignificant given your yeah. okay. uh, Got current it. budget. And uh, part of this uh, motion, would you, I know we had this discussion at the committee when we were debating those two options, that there's a burden on housing providers to be applying every year. If we go through the grant option, is there ways to create maybe multi-year option that you apply once, then you're exempted for, or you get the grant for say four years or budget cycle, I'm just trying to get it that we don't have, we're not forcing people to be applying every year and create more or, and, or, or streamline the application process, make it as simple as possible. Yeah, so that's our intention, uh, Mayor Sohi, is that we would streamline the renewal process. So an application requires a little bit more information. So renewal is just simply, are you still doing what you're doing? Does this still apply? Uh, that would be you know, fairly straightforward. And as we mentioned during the original conversation, had we gone the exemption route, there is still a renewal yeah, expectation. Yeah, I, I so. understand that. I just can 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 it be done over multiple years instead of applying every year? Can maybe I'll it? ask that to Cam Ashmore for okay. comment. Yeah, Mr. Mayor, what we prepared sort of contemplates the multiple year option. It gives uh, administration the ability to essentially waive the yearly application if they get enough information that something's going to be continuously providing affordable housing over a period of a number of years based on the agreements that they've already entered into. So that's okay. contemplated Got within it. the yeah. existing documentation. Great. All right, thank you. Thank you so much for that. That's all, Mr. Chair. Thank you. I'll just take a quick turn, but maybe following up on that, either Mr. Zabo or Mr. Ashmore, our, our plan A is for the province to exempt these properties in the first place, and then we don't need to layer on our own uh, exemptions or grants or what have you, correct? That's correct. We're currently working with the province about their approach, so we'll see how that turns out. Right. Uh, can we offer a um, timeline for the second part of the motion? The first part comes back to our uh, uh, our four-year budget deliberations, but um, the report to executive committee typically would be 13 weeks, give or take. Um, uh, what would it be an appropriate timeline, uh, Mr. Zabo, from your perspective? We can prepare that report within the normal turnaround. Okay, so the clerk can maybe uh, provide a date uh, just as we're continuing our conversation. Thank you. Um, Councillor Tang. Uh, yeah, I just had a couple questions on this, on this item related to the province as well. So if the provincial government is also ex examining eligibility, does it, does it overlap with the city's work? Uh, to the certain extent. Sorry. To a certain extent, right? So what we're discussing here is a grant program. So we've, as earlier as earlier discussed in previous reports, a lot of affordable housing is currently taxable under provincial legislation. So what this grant program is trying to do is to achieve a, a municipal tax payback for anything that is currently taxable. If the government of Alberta makes it exempt, then the grant program becomes redundant because there's nothing to grant back. They don't have taxes owing. Uh, the big question that falls to the province is, are they going to include education tax as part of that exemption? So they're contemplating some different options, whether or not they want to just simply say, it's up to municipalities to exempt from this proportion, which is effectively the same thing as what we're currently doing with the grant program, 
-hmm. or uh, we will exempt this entirely, including the education portion, in which case the grant program becomes redundant. Okay, yeah. And I think the report also asked, uh, said the city requested exemptions be accompanied by provincial grants. Um, do you have a response or, or when are you anticipating a response? I do not have an answer in terms of the timelines, perhaps. Uh, With respect to the province, do you mean? Yeah. yeah. Correct. Um, for what, I mean, it, there's no guarantees, obviously, Councillor Tang, but we do meet very regularly with staff and seniors in housing, and they indicated to us last week that they uh, are actively aware of the request and are working on it and are hoping to um, put it in front of decision makers later this year. To, to be applied for next year. Uh, yeah, Potential. I'm not sure. Yeah, I mean, there's always a lag. We actually asked this. <laughs> we, there is a bit of a lag between when legislate, even if, it, it, say they were to approve the decision, then legislative steps would need to be taken, and there's usually a delay between implementation, so it's hard to say exactly the time frame, but they are very sort of live to the discussion and request, and are, um, at, at the administrative level, are working to bring it forward. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Wright. Thank you very much. Um, I'm just wondering, <clears throat> um, the properties that it, <clears throat> have been identified, they were um, gathered from the, the housing providers, is that right? So, Councillor, this is a list that's compiled between organizations that have approached council directly and organizations that have approached the housing area. So that list was compiled uh, of those ones who made specific requests for tax cancellation. And what we will do as part of that report is analyze each of these uh, for under a certain criteria about ownership, you know, when they started operating as affordable housing units, uh, how much taxes they've owed over that period of time uh, to give an accurate number of what that might look like. So there could be others beyond this list that that haven't we yet come forward, or we we only know what we've been what we've who's who's approached us, right? So the the world of affordable housing is quite diverse, and there's a lot of accounts out there. When we did our analysis about the five million dollar grant program, we had about fifteen hundred uh, accounts, but we can't promise that that's the entire list either, right? So. It's always a challenge for us to, to be 100% certain. So if, if other housing providers hear about this and, and want to be included in this analysis and this report, is the opportunity there for them to do so? Not within this current report, but certainly council could, always, council could always make additional motions. Okay, so it maybe could be amended to, to include others that have not yet been identified? Well, it would be no. a different motion at a different time okay. with a new set of accounts. Okay, thank you. And um, I understand that the, the province is anticipating about a $511 million surplus with the, the, the price per barrel of oil. Um, would that be sufficient to cover these grant requests? Certainly that would be more than sufficient to cover these requests, although I note that these would be ongoing exemption programs, whereas uh, government surpluses uh, come and go. Okay, thank you very much. That's all I have. Thank you, Councillor Rutherford. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so, no questions on the first part. I wish these actually weren't together though, just as a, uh, piece of information I'm you know it was already kind of mentioned that this is not a comprehensive list but I guess one of my questions is when we're looking at tax relief for 2021 and 2022 when we've already set the budget what is the room within that current tax relief budget like would this potentially go over that and would any other additional requests really strain our budget as part of that report relief? Yeah, thank you, Councillor. As part of this report, we're going to have to identify a funding source for these these tax cancellation amounts. Depending on the, the size of it, there might be something we can accommodate within existing budgets. If it becomes too large, then we might have to have a conversation about that. But we won't know that until we do the analysis. So we just have to review these accounts and determine what those numbers are. Well, we've had many conversations about tax exemptions before and how, you know, this is kind of a potential dangerous precedent to set. We just recently revised the policy, correct? So we're kind of, again, going outside of our recently revised policy. Would that be fair to say? Uh, yeah, so the policy C-607 relates to retroactive tax forgiveness. This is a form of retroactive tax cancellation that's being contemplated here. Certainly, this is these kinds of examples are not within the policy. 
although the policy I'll, I'll note is meant to cover you know 95 percent of the cases and certainly this is a bit of an outlier unique situation that we're addressing here and so we just passively it was kind of like whoever was the, the the loudest and okay my other question is and I know this is a generating a report, but I think it's a matter of like, do we even have this administration do this work? Is is the is the reason I'm asking these questions right now? Because a report generation is still work. Council Rutherford, um, I believe these properties were identified during the engagement process, and most I, I believe most, if not all, on the list were identified because in the minds of the providers, they were their properties that are operating very similar to other properties that they own that were previously exempted and they were taken by surprise by the fact that they are taxable. And so that, that came out in the engagement um, and that's where sort of the case was made by them, um, I believe to counselors to um, consider exempting, exempting them into, to allow for um, forgiveness until a, a grant program you know, theoretically could be approved by council in the future. So that was the rationale for, I think, the specific list of properties. It wasn't sort of the loudest or the most, or a random assortment. It was tied to um, expectations. Okay, well, one thing that was said in the housing reports was that we're not gonna define affordable housing. I, I did read that in the reports. I don't know which of the 6.1 to 6.6 .6 it was. There was a lot of information coming at us. That was in the taxation report. There was a reference to, for the purpose of uh, defining who's eligible potentially for the grant program. We wouldn't set a hard and fast definition of affordable housing. Rather, we'd look at the legal obligations that each provider may have to an, a funder that's an order of government around the provision of affordable housing and use that as the definition. Okay. I don't have any further further questions on this. I'm very concerned about the second part of the motion here. I think we as a council need to stop looking retroactively at fixing things and go forward. And I think 2023 is our opportunity to do that and to set that path in course. And I think there's some major budget implications. I think there's some relational implications to this um, ask because there will be people that will be left out. and. Um, yeah, I, I would really highly cautious my call, caution my colleagues a, a, around the second point there. And uh, I will leave it at that. I've spoken to it and asked my question. So I am complete on this item. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councillor Jens. No further support. Council, uh, Mayor Sohi? No. Any further questions on these motions? Anyone caring to speak to it? Councillor Jans to close. Nothing to add. Uh, all right, then let's uh, call the question. Please vote. Just be one second before it's live. I guess before, uh, before you do that, uh, is there anybody on committee that needs these separated for voting purposes? Could I just see the first part of the of the motion? We'll just roll that down. Yeah. Okay, I'm not hearing a I'm not hearing a request to separate for voting purposes. So let's uh, call the vote, please. We have five votes. Please display the vote. That is carried. Uh, okay. Any other votes, pardon me, motions on 6 1 to 6 6 or 6 12 and 13? Although I think we've dealt with 12 and 13 now. Two uh, other questions. On, I have a question on 612. I'm just trying to understand. Okay, we, completed, we completed questions and motions. Yeah. So is there a motion required for the, the service packages for the direction? We, no. That was asked and answered no. Okay, good. Then I have nothing further. We've, we've completed questions on all of the reports. We were on subsequence. So if there's no other subsequent motions, then the meet, these items are complete. OK, 
Okay. Nothing else? Going once, going twice. On to the next item. Thank you very much for all of your work and your time. This is uh, not easy, so good on you. This takes us to item 6.7. Apologies, Mr. Chair, just to tidy up the minutes, would it be okay to uh, do a receipt for information on 6.1 through 6.5? So sure. move. Please vote. on its way. Just looking for one more vote. I would. I just voted. <laughs> Thank you. We have five votes. <laughs> Please display the vote. That is carried. Uh, item 6-7, snow and ice control. Good morning, Mr. Sebrick. Uh, good morning, uh, Councillor Carmel, uh, members of committee, members of council. We do have a presentation that we will uh, share with you this morning, and then we'll be happy to take questions following the presenters. We'll just get that up for you. So good morning, good morning again. Uh, Edmontonians live in a winter city and it's incredibly important work uh, managing snow and ice uh, so that Edmontonians have the accessibility no matter how they travel. The snow and ice control program enables Edmontonians to experience a safe and livable winter city, ensuring residents can safely connect to and access spaces, services, facilities and mobility networks. In April, we shared with you an analysis of the snow and ice control program and options to enhance service standards. At Council's direction, we have developed a programmed approach to snow and ice control. The program is informed by a jurisdictional scan, a GBA plus analysis, counselor, community, staff, and stakeholder feedback. We understand the challenges that Council will face in this upcoming budget cycle. While every service decision has trade-offs, we believe the programmed approach in front of you today and options for phasing balances affordability with the safety, mobility, and livability that Edmontonians are looking for in a snow and ice control program. With me this morning is Craig McEwen, our branch manager of Parks and Road Services, as well as Val Dasik, our general supervisor of infrastructure field operations. We also have a fully uh, functional cross, integra uh, cross functional integrated team from across the corporation with representatives from finance, communications and engagement and community standards, all available to answer questions as needed in relation to the Snow and Ice Control Program. I'll now ask Craig to walk you through the majority of the presentation. Okay, thank you, Gordon. So first we wanted to uh, show a slide to talk about what we heard, uh, what we heard from the community. Uh, so to inform the proposed options that we uh, are or that we presented to council earlier this year, administration conducted significant engagement through uh, NGBA uh, plus analysis. So following our discussion with council in April and May, we conducted additional engagement through uh, public survey, and that received just over 4,000 responses. Um, as our frontline employees are delivering the service and often hear from residents firsthand, uh, we also wanted to ensure that their input was incorporated, uh, and so a special feedback session was conducted with any frontline staff who wanted to attend. So both the public and staff feedback were used to adjust the programmed approach uh, that's in the report. So as shown in the word cloud, generated over uh, four, or sorry, 700 open-ended comments in the survey, took out key themes we heard from uh, survey comments, including snow removal, windrows, sandboxes, sidewalks, taxes, and residential streets. Some of the main feedback we heard from the survey uh, are that 60% of the respondents are in support of uh, some level of service increase and associated tax increase for roads. Uh, respondents are split between support for maintaining the same service as 2021 
2022 winter season or increasing service levels throughout uh, one of the two proposed options. Of those uh, in support of increased service for active pathways, uh, there is twice as much support for AP1 over AP3. 74% of the respondents uh, are in support of clearing residential windrows, blocking driveways and curb cuts. Uh, so we're still just on the, the last slide. 74% um, of the respondents are in support of clearing residential windrows, blocking driveways and curb cuts. And among respondents who may be interested in an assisted snow program for people with disabilities or mobility challenges, 48% are most interested in services offered through their community league or a nonprofit organization. So the programmed approach that we'll uh, discuss in the presentation today, and that I'll discuss in more detail on the next slide, uh, will take into consideration residences lived experiences, it protects vulnerable mobility network users, addresses unintended, unintended, unintentional systematic service delivery inequity and contributes to Vision Zero. It balances residences' needs and operational staff experience with how we uh, can most effectively and efficiently improve our services. So just jump to the next slide. And so this is a summary of what the programmed approach uh, uh, and what those, deliver or what those deliverables would look like. So the programmed approach for Roadways 1, uh, Active Pathways 1, so R1 and AP1 in the report, it includes a, a phased implementation over three winter seasons. Uh, so this is to account for financial considerations and operational requirements. This includes the time it would take to hire and train new staff, acquire equipment, and make any adjustments to contracts that would be needed. Uh, so this approach enables operations to be more effective in responding to different types of weather events. It provides a noticeable increase in the level of service and consistency of service to residents. It results in increased safety, mobility, and livability of Edmontonians uh, and provides value for tax dollars. Although Roadways uh, 0 0.5 and Active Pathways 3, so R0.5, AP3, although those options were included in the council motion and the report for your consideration, we did not include them in this present presentation. So going with the R0.5 option would result in operations not being able to fully utilize our current equipment. And AP3 would result in a noticeable service level of improvement for priority three areas, uh, but the cost and resourcing requirements would be significantly more than AP1. So on the far left-hand side of this, uh, of this chart, you'll see uh, the current state. And so that's really last winter season. Um, that column shows the budget and service delivery levels uh, for the most recent snow uh, and ice season, so last this past winter. And then in the following columns uh, to the right, uh, the approach shows the operating budget increases as well as the service delivery increases uh, over a total of three winter seasons. The delivery times, uh, the service delivery times represent the timelines that would be needed to clear and maintain the roads and active pathways within these categories based on average winter events and an average winter season. The budget increases shown here, uh, shown by winter season and not by calendar year. This programmed approach includes uh, all resourcing and costing for the proposed changes for roadways and active pathways, uh, plus the new service enhancements outlined in the motion. So that includes increased parking bans uh, and sidewalk enforcement, introducing a tow during parking bans, uh, clearing public squares and internal paved pathways in parks and playgrounds, expanding wind row free zones in front of schools uh, to include, include both sides of the road, uh, and clearing residential wind rows blocking driveway and curb cuts, and an assisted snow program, which would include uh, formalizing and expanding uh, the current snow to go pilot program. So jump to the next slide. Uh, this slide covers what Edmontonians would experience. So with this approach, there'd be a noticeable improvement to overall snow and ice service delivery for Edmontonians within the first year of implementation. And so then these are just a few of the improvements Edmontonians could expect to see. They'd expect to see faster response to weather events uh, and service requests, uh, would keep city roads and active pathways in better condition and improve overall safety and accessibility of Edmontonians' uh, mobility network. So for example, if public sidewalks and staircases uh, and around bus benches are cleared sooner, there would be less packed snow or ice to address. Clearing curb cuts, driveways, and prioritizing windrow pickup near schools would improve accessibility, safety, and pedestrian mobility. Cleared pub public squares and internal paved pathways within parks would improve accessibility to parkland, playgrounds, and public spaces year-round. 
formalizing the city's snow to go program that would allow community leagues to facilitate snow and ice clearing for services uh, for seniors, persons with limited mobility, and newcomers to Canada. Improvements to the snow and ice control program would be supported by increased enforcement. With the addition of dedicated enforcement officers, uh, and, and residents could expect to see an increased uh, in, in snow and ice, or sorry, snow on sidewalk investigations uh, to ensure sidewalks adjacent to private adjacent to private properties uh, are maintained for increased safety and accessibility. There would also be proactive parking ban enforcement and towing, allowing operators to groom residential uh, roads curb to curb in a safe and efficient manner. Although we're in the process of conducting a full program review uh, of the community sandbox program, the programmed approach would result in some minor service improvements uh, for sandboxes uh, in subsequent winters. So administration will also be returning to council in 2023 with our findings and proposed program changes uh, for council's consideration specific to the sandbox program. Uh, so as part of our, our programmed approach, we would not be blading to bare pavement on residential roads and we would return to our previous practice of maintaining uh, and grooming these roads to a five centimeter snowpack in, a, in, in accordance with our snow and ice uh, administrative procedure. So this, um, this programmed approach uh, would enhance service delivery in key areas uh, that have received the most feedback from Edmontonians, balancing safety, accessibility, service outcomes, and costs. So this slide um, is a visual representation of the evaluation framework. Sorry, next slide. This is a visual representation of what our uh, evaluation framework would look like. So administration will present an evaluation of the snow and ice program's effectiveness, performance, and ser service delivery measures to council at the end of each winter season. This framework would complement and build upon uh, our current robust snow and ice monitoring framework, uh, and uh, our new evaluation components would include performance results of each of the service levels outlined in the administrative procedure or our service delivery scorecard. Uh, feedback from community, employees, the union, stakeholders, and council. Results of the Snow and Ice to Go program. Metrics for bylaw and parking ban compliance and support from enforcement officers. Information and metrics about snow and ice control communications. So th through flexible and adaptable service delivery, we will make adjustments with our, within our administrative procedure, which describes the service levels, uh, i.e. our public expectations. Uh, and budget to ensure that the snow and ice control program best meet the needs of Edmontonians. A phased program approach, as we've outlined in the report, would allow uh, us and council to evaluate our service delivery and resource allocation changes um, from season to season. And so if any further changes or adjustments are needed, these decisions and changes would be made uh, in between winter seasons prior to the start of the subsequent winter. Our plan is to maintain uh, consistent snow and ice delivery methods and levels throughout each season. This will allow administration to effectively and consistently measure and evaluate uh, the entire season and be able to compare any changes year over year. This will, allow, uh, this will also help ensure that we're clearly communicating with council, with staff and the public about what they can expect from us in terms of service delivery each year. Uh, next slide. All of that said, uh, the program approach that's in the report um, comes at a cost. And so we wanted to focus this slide on the financial considerations. So this programmed approach has both short and long-term financial impacts. If council, if council chooses to move forward today with approving any service level changes for the 22 to 23 winter season, uh, residents would see service improvements uh, beginning this winter. There would need to be, um, there would also be need, there are, excuse me, there would be a need for funding to cover 2022 costs on a one-time basis this year, uh, which would need a one-time funding source. If council approves service level increases for this winter, it is presumed that council is prepared to make a decision uh, to approve further funding for 23 to 26 on an ongoing basis in advance of considering other priorities during the 23 to 26 budget uh, deliberations later this fall. So if council chooses this option, the Financial Stabilization Reserve, or the FSR, is a potential funding source for the 9.5 million in one-time costs for 2022. 
However, if the FSR were to be used, this would result in just under $3 million remaining in the FSR before dropping below its minimum balance. So Council's ability to fund other one-time urgent items would be limited uh, for the remainder of this year. If Council chooses to postpone any decisions for uh, approving service level changes until the 23 to 26 bu budget deliberations, uh, residents would not experience significant service levels improvements this year and any service improvements and spending for future years would depend on the 23 to 26 budget approval process. And so it should be noted that there's already a project, uh, a projected unfavorable variance of 10.6 million for snow and ice control this year uh, as a result of increased snow pickup due to weather conditions uh, and bare pavement pilot. Next slide. So we have a number, administration has, has developed several um, implementation options for council's consideration. So option A, that's on the slide in front of you, reflects the information we've presented today. This is the programmed approach, the full R1, AP1 implementation with enhancements phased over three years, starting this upcoming winter season uh, in 22 and 23. The column to the right, option B, includes a full R1, AP1 implementation, um, but with all the enhancements, such as removing windrows from driveway entrances and curb cuts, that would be postponed until the 23 to 24 winter season, uh, and the programmed approach would be phased out over four years, starting this winter. So enforcement of the parking ban and snow on sidewalk investigations would still begin in the winter of, of 22 to 23. Uh, moving to the right, option C, includes a full R1, AP1 implementation, um, but with funding being deferred to fall budget uh, discussions. Implementation would be postponed until not this winter, but next winter season, uh, and rolled out over four years. So this means that rent, uh, residents would not experience significant service level improvements for this upcoming winter, uh, and any service improvements and spending for future years would depend on the 23 to 26 budget approval, budget approval process. If Council does not wish to proceed uh, with Administration's R1, AP1 um, recommended programmed approach, option D, uh, the furthest one on the right, will enable Administration to make some small adjustments to the current program, which will result in better utilization of the City's current equipment this, this upcoming winter. Uh, the ongoing annual cost to maintain these adjustments is $5.9 million. Uh, this option uh, also includes enforcement of the parking ban and snow and sidewalk investigations. Council could decide to proceed with any uh, combination of these options or another approach entirely. Uh, however, these are our best recommendations based on our operational experience and the information we've gathered. It should also be noted that if Council chooses to provide initial funding for the first two months of this winter season in 2022, and provides no further funding for the rest of the season as part of the 23 to 26 budget deliberations, uh, it would result in a negative budget variance for the snow and ice control program in 2023. And last, last slide. So we're committed to delivering uh, reliable snow and ice control services that will make a difference to Edmontonians, a service that supports safe mobility, accessibility, and connectivity. In order to proceed with any program changes for the upcoming winter season, administration requires clear direction from Council as an outcome from this report. Regardless of the direction provided by Council, our plan for this upcoming season is, first of all, to maintain consistent snow and ice control service delivery methods and levels throughout the entire 22-23 season and future winter seasons. Secondly, to ensure that Edmontonians understand what services they can expect through a robust snow and ice control communications plan. And third, to return to Council in the spring of next year with an end of season evaluation of our service delivery performance. This is to ensure consistency of service, our ability to evaluate our service performance effectively, and to be clear in our communication of expectations with the public. Our goal is to improve the experience for Edmontonians to live work and play in our winter city, supported by a clear path in which to move forward, new ways to evaluate our performance, as well as attainable service standards and resources that will enable us to meet that goal. In order for us to move forward for this upcoming winter season, we require direction from Council, 
whether to implement service level changes for this winter or to postpone any decisions until the 23-26 budget process is undertaken. In accordance with this direction and corresponding budget implications, administration is prepared to be flexible and proceed as directed by council. hear you say that you were finished I'm sorry sorry my apologies yeah. uh, thank you very much for the presentation then so now we'll hear from our speakers uh, presuming that you will step back while we hear from our speakers and we have two registered uh, Steve Bradshaw from ATU local 569 and Eric Lewis from CUPE local 30 Do we know if Mr. Bradshaw is joining us today? Anyone? You can't today? Okay, so I think it's just you, Mr. Lewis. Thanks very much, you have five minutes. Thank you. Uh, good morning, committee members. Thank you for the opportunity to present today. My remarks will be brief, but I wanted to make sure that you know that this is an issue that my members is, are still concerned about, as they want to be equipped to do the best job that they can do on behalf of the citizens of Edmonton. We believe that administration's recommendations are positive. Our members in snow and ice have repeatedly said that they need more resources to meet the expectation of Edmontonians. And this is an opportunity for council to start properly funding this critical service. More staff and more equipment will go a long way to improve these services. But we want to stress two things. First, our operations need more staff. But we would encourage you hire full-time staff, not temp staff. We have previously identified a number of issues associated with using short time contracts for this type of work. And I know Councillor Wright gave notice that she will be asking for more information to be provided, but I will stress these. Temporary positions have a negative impact on operations and on the people doing the work. I have had conversations with members and management who are not QP30 members, and I hear the same message over and over again. We need full time staff for consistency. I heard in the report that consistency came up numerous times. Consistency brings efficiencies. Consistency is having full-time staff, permanent. Second, we would encourage you to avoid the bare minimum and hire enough staff to relieve some of the pressures that work areas are under. Last year, our members were told that they could come in whenever they wanted for overtime because they were short, so short-staffed. The usual process is, an expression of interest of overtime or call in if you need overtime, but there was an open door policy this winter where you show up, we have work for you. This creates an issue for work areas, lots of money being spent on overtime and members because they work themselves ragged and have no chance to recharge. If the areas are staffed adequately, there will still be overtime, that's the nature of it, but we would be, it wouldn't be as severe as it has been recently. Thank you again for the chance to speak today. I also want to thank you to the councillors and uh, members who have taken the time to come visit some of the facilities with me and speak with the local 30 members. These site visits really make my members feel council cares about the work they do, gives them the opportunity to tell how passionate they are about the work and the frustrations they have had with the way things are being run. I'm happy to take any members of council around to visit with my members and hear about the work they do for the citizens of Edmonton. I'm currently arranging site visit with peace officers who deal with the homeless encampments and encampment cleanup members. Thanks. Thank you. Any questions? And, and just, well, Remember that we're talking about snow and ice control investment scenarios today. That's our decision point. Questions? Yeah. Okay, there's something wrong with the system. Um, uh, Mayor Soden. Yeah, thank you so much for being here and also thank you to you and, uh, and uh, your members as well. Uh, over the last uh, winter wasn't easy. So thank you so much for all the hard work that uh, all of them have, uh, have done. Uh, you seen the administration's recommendation. Just want to get your thoughts on uh, on the option of, uh, 
uh, utilizing the existing uh, equipment and hiring more workers to do that. That's one option, not recommended, not recommended, but what do you think of that? Sorry, the option to use? U utilize the existing equipment that we don't haven't utilized yet because of the shortage of staff. That's one of the options that administration, or we could consider, but it's not recommended. So I'm not understanding the question. Yeah, so in the report, uh, there is a discussion. For example, last winter, we were not able to properly utilize all the equipment that we have because we were shortage of staff, Yeah. right? So one of the option is that we hire more people and utilize that equipment first before we make other enhancements. Just want to get your thoughts. Yeah, so we had um, multiple visits at the yards, and one, that was one of the things that we heard was that a lot of the equipment sat yeah. this winter. And uh, the city spends, you know, loads of money on this equipment to just sit there and um, collect snow or dust. So it would be great if we could hire some more staff that would be able to use this equipment and keep it running and on the roads. And that would, uh, how much improvement do you think you we would experience if we were to utilize the existing equipment by hiring more staff? So I heard that there was, from my members, I heard there was about 35 to 40 percent of the equipment sitting. Yeah. Uh, obviously there is some equipment that is downtime that, that you need to for when it breaks down, you yeah. need to have that replacement one. So, um, and I, I believe about 25 percent of that you want to account for that downtime. So I, w I would think that there was about 15 to 20 percent of equipment that could have been used okay okay good all right that just needed need your perspective on that so the all the equipment that is not being utilized some of them would not be utilized because this needs to be out of service for repairs and maintenance and all that yeah so when a vehicle breaks down um you have to have a replacement vehicle yeah. so if if a, a plow goes down you need to be able to get another plow on the road to put that body into that vehicle so okay you have that, um, that spare equipment so that if there is downtime, you don't have bodies sitting there do nothing. You have people being able to jump into another piece of equipment and carry on. So you need that backup. Yeah. yeah. Got it. Okay. Thank you so much for that. Thank you. Yeah. And thank you once again for you and your members. Thank you. Councillor Wright. Thanks. Um, hi, Eric. I'm, I'm just wondering, so if we hire more staff, uh, more permanent staff, what happens if we don't get the snow that we had this past year? Fingers crossed. What can they do? So it was in the QP30 snow and ice report that was sent out earlier this year. There's uh, multiple things that uh, the members can do. There's cross training where they can go and um, help out other areas. They can help out, you know, filling the sandboxes. I know there was at one point 150 sandboxes in 2017 and now there's over 750 sandboxes, but we're still running with staff that would do 150 sandboxes. Um, they can work on other areas about like school zones, getting wind of windrows in the school zones, just being on top of, of some of the stuff. Um, there was suggestions on um, cutting the tree lines in some of the annex roads, going down there and, and getting those cut up so that that um, is out of the ditches. Um, there was litter control. If there's no snow, um, we see a lot of litter that gets blown around in the winter time, and there was that option of doing that. So there are other options. We just have to think outside the box. And from when I was out there at the at the South Yard, um, the 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 asphalt for filling in potholes as they is that something else that yeah, could be cross trained that, or yeah, that's another thing that the members can do because the people that do the snow and ice in the winter time also are the people that do the asphalt repairs in the summertime. And some of that equipment that was left um, unused, like would that be like the skid steers and like I'm just wondering, is there some contract work that could be done? I'm I'm not 100% sure of all the different types of equipment that was being used. I was told a lot of it was like um, the plow trucks that were being used. Um, I'm not sure with the skid steers, uh, how many skid steers the city owns and how many sat over the winter time and, and weren't being used. Okay, I'll ask administration that then. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Councillor Tang. <clears throat> uh, thank you very much for being here, Eric. Um, just, you said to uh, hire more full-time staff, but what about just converting existing uh, temporary workers into full-time positions? Yeah, we could do that, but I think we also need 
more staff. Um, just from what we saw happening this year, that the current staffing levels aren't enough. So if we were to take those temps and put them into full time, we would still need to hire more staff. Um, <clears throat> and you mentioned at the beginning that your members think the, the current recommendation is positive and is it primarily sort of the, the, the staffing element that they feel is positive because more resource for hiring? Or, yeah. and, and are there other things you wanted to add to that? So equipment and staffing were the two were the two things that did come up. Um, one of the things that I've heard from my members is that the equipment we're purchasing um, does go down a lot often, and um, we have a hard time getting parts for it. We we get some equipment that are from across the country or in a different country, and to get things fixed on it takes a while. When there are uh, equipment that we can buy more locally and um, that equipment could be up and operational a lot sooner because there's parts readily available. And parts are readily available locally? Yeah. Okay, okay. Um, cool, that's, that, that's all my question, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, I think that's all of the questions for our speaker. Councillor Rutherford, did you have questions of our speaker or just admin? Just admin, thank you. Thank you. Okay, that concludes our questions of you, uh, Mr. Lewis. Thank you very much for your presentation today and for coming down. Thank and you. And apologies for the inconvenience about not getting into this yesterday. Full meeting. Uh, so we'll invite uh, administration back up. Uh, so I, first of all, just uh, from an agenda management perspective, um, we had two long conversations about snow and ice, one at committee, one at council. And the advice of council uh, was that we are proceeding with the R1 and AP1 and with a host of enhancements. That guidance has been given to administration. So I very strongly recommend we stay away from questions about adding enhancements or taking away enhancements or changing that course of action because we've had that conversation twice for many, many, many hours. So administration has their marching orders on what the program should look like. The question is, how fast do we implement it? How fast do we put money to that program and to the, to the, to the new program, if you will? So on that basis then, because I've exempted this item, I'm gonna take my turn first, and I'm gonna put in op uh, implementation, implementation option B on the table and move that and uh, introduce it briefly here. Uh, that is a bit of a middle ground um, implementation option. It doesn't include all of the enhancements we talked about. It does include the enforcement uh, enhancements and it get, activates the equipment that was otherwise, uh, as I understand it, sitting idle last winter. Uh, the reason I'm doing that is because uh, I'm a little concerned about consuming just about all of what is left in FSR for the remainder of the year. Uh, so this gets us started. Uh, and it, it allows us to begin the implementation of, of this new strategy, but to largely, largely talk about it at the four-year uh, budget conversation that is coming. So it's a, a bit of a slower roll, but it is a roll. Uh, and so that's, uh, that's the reasons why I'm putting option B on the floor. Happy to take any questions, and of course, any questions to administration, uh, just please keeping in mind that advice around staying away from operations and management questions. Uh, Councillor Tang. Oh, I thought I thought Councillor Wright was before me. Um, yeah, no, I appreciate the motion. Actually, I and and I will support this. Um, one of the things that just kind of came to me was that I know we're talking about option B, but uh, last week when we were talking about this with administration, it was eight point A, and then the replacement report made it nine point five, and it was quite confusing and I, I worry about if we're already kind of miscalculating that and escalating that now, what other un unanticipated uh, changes might come later. Um, I wanna, yeah, I wanna give you a chance just to comment on that discrepancy and, and kind of what happened. Yeah, no, no problem, that was, that was an oversight. Um, what we did was calculating the uh, amount of cost in, and so there was almost two different things. There was. Uh, the cost for a snow season and then the cost for each calendar year. And so what we did was we were calculating accurately for the snow season and then how we were splitting the costs between calendar years. Um, we spread it out proportionally 
Um, however, one of the activities, and specifically what it was, is increasing the windrow pickup to both sides of the streets in the school zone. We split that cost proportionally between 2022 and 2023, but that's a one-time activity that we planned and scheduled for December, so that couldn't have been proportionally split up. And so the overall snow season cost didn't change, um, but there was just uh, those that 700,000 that would have moved from 23 to 22 in that option. And so it was just a, uh, an event that had a particular cost to it that we had spread out over uh, the, had, that we had spread out over the winter season, um, in fact couldn't and it needed to land in the one calendar year. And so that's that's calculation we picked up on and corrected the report. And so that's the difference between the 8.8 .8 or 8.7 to 8 .8. the 9.5, which is the correct number. So that affected option one, uh, A, but would it affect this, uh, this 4.7 option or option B? Uh, that would be just want to double check that we won't be that we, there won't be other adjustment after this. No, okay. that one's in those numbers are correct. Okay. They're embedded within that. Great. Um, and uh, I may have missed it during the presentation, but can you just uh, uh, remind me the the service level expected for bus stops? Um, because I think my understanding is that we do currently service the bus stops, but I think um, Mr. Bracha, who wasn't able to be here, one of the you know, highlights uh, that he provided is kind of the challenges around um, clearing around bus stops. So I wanted to see if you can comment on that. Uh, Councillor, just in, in the option uh, B? Yeah. Just one second. I guess, I guess, what, I guess what I'm trying to say is, you know, even with our current service level, there's an expectation of servicing the bus stop. You know, would, would this, you know, are we, shouldn't we already be doing that? Uh, but we're seeing, hearing so much of the challenge. Um, you know, is there any expectation of any service improvements there? Uh, short answer is yes. So that is a part of our program. Okay. Um, there would be an expected increase in service levels and the time it would take to clear uh, bus stops, benches, the, the right. areas around that bus stop. So that would be, there would be a noticeable improvement um, in option A and option B around the bus stops. Um, um, the great, yeah, thank you. No, that's, that's helpful. I think I, I just wanted that to be kind of set on, on record. And i um, uh, wondering if you have a response to some of the concerns around um, just full-time hiring that was brought up by the speaker. Uh, because I know this was brought up in their last um, submission uh, to, to management and to council. So, Councillor uh, Tang, we have uh, a body of work that was actually commenced prior to the pandemic and then paused and then reinstated, and that was looking at all of our seasonal staff uh, across not only snow and ice control programs, but uh, all of our operational programs. So that work was underway. We did complete okay. the waste area. And right. The intent is that we are working through the parks and roads services now, with snow and ice being one of the priorities. So the concept would be that we would look at, uh, if we go with one of these options, we would look at uh, additional uh, hires as well as converting some of the existing hires to uh, from seasonal to permanent. So it would be a combination of both. Yeah, great. Thank you so much. Just in my last 15 seconds, um, yeah, happy to support the motion on the table here. Um, and I think I've, I've said this to administration, one of the things that I do worry about is, you know, no matter the level of service we, we, we strive for, there will always be an expectation gap. Uh, and uh, so that's just something I think to be mindful of for all of us. Thank you so much. Thank you, Councillor Wright. Um, thank you. So um, just getting back to the, the, uh, the unused equipment. So that would have to be, um, so that would have to be done by city employees. That our unused equipment couldn't be done by contractors, right? We we use city uh, forces to operate city equipment. Okay, so if we're gonna um, put those into action, then it would be city workers that we would need. Correct. Okay, um, and then, sorry, with the um, with option B, the postponed postponing the enhan enhancements that would include the enhancements of clearing both sides of the roads around school zones, right? That's right. Okay. Now that is to postpone it until January of 2023. So the expectation is that we would still be able to address that in the beginning half, like in January of 2023. 
but that would be to protect the FSR in 2022. Okay. Um, how much snow are we going to get before <laughs> January? I, I'm just concerned about the, the safety, and we've heard that from the schools as well, from the school boards. and. Um, there, there are windrow-free zones in schools. And just so on the one side. On the though. one side. So this enhancement would be to uh, include on both sides. And the intention there was it would be a one-time pickup. And so we would be targeting um, uh, at that Christmas season. So right in the middle of the season, we would do a one-time pickup uh, for the windrows on the other side. Um, and not pushing the snow from the one side to the other, which takes place today. So there's often a larger windrow on the other side of the street. Um, this would be not doing that and doing a one-time pickup uh, is the enhancement. Oh, and then so if there's more snow in February or March, that's just left, the windrows? It would be, um, it would be a, a change in the, the procedure where we're not pushing the snow from the one side of the street to the other, so it wouldn't be keeping that same. So I guess the, the answer to that would be, um, the way to which we would be um, pushing the snow in the school zones would be different, so there would be a noticeable difference uh, regardless. Okay, so we're, we're gonna end up with windrows on both sides of the street in the, in the school zone? So right now the procedure is that we clean from the one side so that the one side is completely clear, um, and then with this enhancement, we would be picking up the other side more frequently. So right now, the current uh, procedure is that we pick it up once, two, twice, usually once per year. This would be an additional time, so both sides would see a reduction overall due to the amount of times we were picking up. To a maximum of twice per season? Yes. Okay. And that's only under option, those are the enhancements, so none of that would be included in option B? Until 2023. Until 2023, okay. Okay, um, and Mr. Clement. Oh, and, I, I, and Mr. Seppert, can you maybe contact, comment on the, the equipment and the, is the, the repairs and maintenance and that? Um, is that due to supply chain issues or? Well, I think over the last two winter seasons, we did see supply chain issues. But I think part of what we try and do again is uh, having a spare ratio and having an integrated service level with uh, our fleet and facilities group. So there certainly were challenges over the last two years. I think part of what Mr. Uh, Lewis alluded to is, is in terms of equipment selection. So when we do choose equipment, it is a selection committee that has representatives uh, from uh, our, our fleet group as well as our operations group and our operators. Certainly there's opportunity to learn more and we have made adjustments on types of equipment based on feedback, but it, it's, um, you know, it, it's an ongoing uh, living process in terms of evaluating the uh, functionality of the equipment. And I, I think that you know, there are some parts that are available locally, but you know, most of the pieces of equipment we ha have uh, purchased uh, we purchase from local vendors, but you know are made at other parts of of Canada and, and North America. So we are dependent on some supply chain issues that are broader than Edmonton. Okay. Okay. Um, and the sandboxes are sort of a separate issue being assessed. Is that right? Yeah, it's a um, it's part of an audit recommendation. So we know that we need to spend some time to focus specifically on that project itself. Now, part of one of these options, um, whether it's option A or B, um, the added staff and resources would see uh, an improvement to service to sandboxes. Um, that said, we still are investigating that entire program as a whole and would come back to council with recommendations on what we should be doing with that particular program. Okay. So no major overhauling changes this upcoming winter within these options, um, but it is a program that we do intend to still investigate and, um, uh, and, and propose options for your consideration. And would you also be coming back in those recommendations? Sorry, Sorry. Councillor Wright. <laughs> no sandbox. Uh, Mayor Sohi. Right. Okay. So the direction was given as well to provide an option on R point five, and uh, I understand you are making a different recommendation based on R one. 
I am concerned that you did not provide that option, right? So would you provide that option as part of the budget consideration when we discuss the, uh, the balance of uh, option B? We, um, we, we did discuss the option within the report. Um, now, the, the reason why we didn't recommend it or, or include it into our programmed approach was it would underutilize uh, the equipment. And so that, that R0.5 option um, didn't include enough staff to fully utilize all of the vehicles and equipment that we have on, on, uh, in, an, in our inventory. Um, so we didn't move that forward as a, uh, an option uh, in, this, in this slide uh, or a part of a recommendation. Um, but we can still come back uh, in the fall with, with additional options for the budget season. Yeah, because I am concerned about the cost. You know, we are, uh, we have other priorities as well, right? Uh, and uh, keeping services at current level is going to require 3.5% property tax increase. And then there are a lot of pressures. Inflation is, uh, affordability is becoming a serious concern for Edmontonians, uh, particularly small businesses as well. So I'm mindful of uh, the cost increases. Uh, because uh, that's another point percent, one percent tax increase, right? Between point five option and uh, an R one option, right? So, uh, I would like to have that as part of the discussion. Uh, the uh, on the uh, yeah, so approving option B will give you enough resources to implement some of the uh, the uh, R one and AP one. My concern also would be if you start ramping it up now in the first part of 2020, in the latter part of 2022, and council does not give you or does not approve the funding package, would you have to scale back? Would you have to lay people off? Like, how do you, how are you going to manage that transition? I think that that's the challenge we're faced with, uh, Your Worship, is that whatever we decide today, we have to be prepared to move forward. And that was why we, we outlined a path forward, but we didn't recommend any specific option as a recommendation because we can't pre-commit council to a budget decision today. Yeah. Um, so I think, to your point, though, we did outline uh, in attachment one the uh, R0.5, but what we did was in the presentation showed uh, a yeah. staged approach. Yeah. So fully aware that council is faced with budget discussions and challenges. Yeah. Okay. So I it, I, I think that's my struggle as well, right? So, uh, uh, and I'm glad that we're going to be debating this in uh, along with many other priorities of uh, of council, right? So. Uh, uh, yeah, okay, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll stop here and, uh, and, and think about it. Thank you, yeah. Thank you, Councillor Rutherford. Hello, can you hear me? Yep, please go ahead. Okay, thank you. Um, can somebody just remind me for the first part of the motion what the amount is? I can't see the, the motion in front of me, I don't have a screen. 4.7 million. 4.7 million? 4.7 million from the FSR. Okay, I guess, so my question to admin is, in your presentation, you mentioned that uh, we're negative 10 million kind of in deficit in the snow clearing, but I thought we already did a spring supplemental budget adjustment from, for, in, with regards to the pilot. So I'm wondering why we're still saying that we're in a deficit due to the pilot. Uh, Councillor, I'll, I'll start and then I'll ask Ms. Padbury to, to just jump in. But in terms of the adjustment and uh, the spring supplementary budget adjustment period, that was to address the additional costs from the pilot uh, with the blading to bare pavement. There was uh, additional costs uh, that we incurred this winter just providing the basic service because of the nature of the winter. And that's something that's common uh, that we've encountered in the past where there will be winters where we are uh, under budget and uh, in uh, winters where we're over budget and that's where the FSR comes in. But I'll just ask Ms. Padbury to provide a little more detail on that. 
Um, so I'm uh, Parm Rai, Branch Manager of Financial Services. So I'm speaking on behalf of Ms. Padbury. So yeah, I think what Mr. Seabrook said there is, is correct. The, the funding we took in the first quarter from the Financial Stabilization Reserve was to cover the cost for the additional blading cycle um, we had um, early in the year. Uh, and so this is just the, the deficit we're incurring so far, just based on your, our, our regular snow service levels. Um, so okay, well, that's a big that's a big distinction than what was in the presentation because the presentation specifically said we're in a deficit of 10 million due to both the pilot project and the snow the the standard operations and changes in you know the amount of snow that we received in the, the latter half of the winter. So I just think our our language needs to be intentional. Um, so I guess my question now with regards to the motion is if we're 10 million in deficit and this motion is for 4.7 for enhanced services, how do we still bridge, like there's still a gap there? Are we, like, I'm just trying to understand what that'll look like come, you know, the decision point today and what that'll look like come December when we're finalizing our other budget. So in terms of the uh, ask on uh, the FSR, the 4.7 was the period or the amount that's allocated to this amendment. But I'll just ask Harm if he can comment in terms of that projection if the 10.4 is already included in that uh, FSR number. It's not Councillor Rutherford. So the, the 10 million that we're projecting right now, we're anticipating by the end of the year for snow, the snow and ice program, it's not reflected in the FSR balance right now. And the reason we, we don't uh, do that is because um, at the end of the year that the FSR balance uh, absorbs um, the overall corporate deficit or, uh, or takes in the surplus. So this would just be a component of that right now. Um, so we don't individually reflect uh, variances for any programs for the FSR until the end of the year and we see the overall picture. So that's why you're not seeing it there. But, but you're right, um, a deficit, an overall deficit for the entire city would, would impact the FSR. Okay. Um, Chilson, I'm on the phone. Um, that's all my questions. Uh, for with regards to this motion, just thank you, admin, for, for your work on this, and I know it's been a lot, and uh, that's it. Thank you, Councillor Cartmill. Thank you, Councillor Neck. Thank you, Councillor Cartmill. Uh, just one question, and, and I know, um, Mr. Chair, you talked about uh, what direction we gave, and I do, I do just want to note that the motion we gave back in May also included a uh, reference to AP3. So I, I do just want to ask one question about it since since that was part of it. Um, will will we have information available to us uh, for consideration of AP3 at budget? That's just what I want to make sure I'll have access to. So information on R0.5 and AP3, um, we did put in the attachment, attachment one kind of outlines um, the different levels of service, uh, the costs associated with R0.5 and AP3. Um, and so based on the cost difference between AP3 and AP1 and the service level improvements between AP1 and AP3 in particular, um, we didn't see uh, we thought it would be more advantageous to move forward with a programmed approach with AP1, um, mm -hmm. just based on the, uh, I guess, additional cost between AP1 and AP3. Um, yeah, that's right, go ahead. So it, it, it is in the report. We did, we did outline, um, you know, a little bit more analysis on that particular option, uh, but didn't put it forward within the programmed approach. So just so I make sure I've, I've understood. So essentially, so with AP1, which uh, brings us up to 40.1 million on AP1 over the three seasons, um, essentially the difference would be, just so I've made sure I've understood, if we ultimately wanted to get to AP3, um, you would need to add in another 38.4 million over the course of a certain amount of time. That's, that's essentially the delta that we're talking about. Is that correct? Just double check that number. Um, I believe that that sounds right. Uh, I would have to just double check that particular sure. number. Sure. I don't need it right now. I just want to make sure that it's something that that I can that that I'm using the knowledge correctly for when when it comes to budget deliberations. Okay. Um, that's it for me, uh, Councillor Carmel. I'll 
uh, I'll speak to it at some point. Thank you, Councillor Neck. Uh, second round, Councillor Wright. Thanks. I just had one other follow-up question. Um, when I had asked Mr. Lewis about um, what other work the city workers could do um, if there was no snow. Uh, with the contractors, what do they do if there's no snow? Do we have them like sort of on a retainer on an all-call base, on-call basis? Uh, Councillor, they're, they're not on a retainer, they are on an on-call basis um, and that's part of some of the challenges in terms of some of the response levels because they aren't on a retainer, they are uh, on an on-call basis. So we're looking at, as part of this work, looking at how we can change uh, the response times within, in the agreement, but they aren't, if they're not working for us, they're not being paid. Okay, so if we're, so if, if we're, if we're paying city staff there's other work they can be doing. Uh, yeah. And, and then they're ready and, and ready to go when that first snow fall, flake falls, right? Their, their primary focus is on snow, but as Mr. Lewis alluded, there are a number of different other programs that we carry out uh, throughout the entire year. So we do move staff from one program area to another. Okay, thank you. And, and since I do just have an extra minute too about the sandboxes, in the report that you're coming back in analysis, um, It'll also include no sandboxes, like what the cost savings would be if, if we didn't maintain that program? Yes. Yes, okay, excellent. Thank you, that's all I have. Um, and I think I will support um, the motion put forward. I don't like the delay in the services, but it's um, a cost savings, I guess, so thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Rice. Councillor Rice. Oh, sorry. So my mic, technical <laughs> challenge. Uh, just a very quick question to confirm the understanding and for the financial implication number is aligned to each other. So right now, and then in the motion, uh, the increase $4.7 million. Uh, by looking at the presentation, the so implementation, actually the total um, operating budget in the following three seasons, and then will be increased from current operating budget, $57.1 million, and to the $111.5 million, right? Is that my understanding right? Uh, the the budget increase. Um, yes. The the difference between options A and B, they would both still see a budget increase to an an ultimate overall snow and ice control budget of 111 million. Um, option B would just be spreading it out over four years versus option A is three years. And we've also backloaded some between the first and second year. Um, that's another difference between options B, A and B. But ultimately, uh, the I overall. I understand that. Uh, I just want to confirm the number right now. If we are uh, passing this motion, the the operating budget will be increased from current fifty seven point one million dollars to one hundred eleven point five. That's right. Correct. So that is almost fifty percent, fifty percent increase, and in the uh, following four years. That's right. However. This is the, this would be the uh, programmed approach that we would be presenting today, whether it's option A or option B. Um, and there would be an impact to the FSR in 2022. However, subsequent years would have to still be approved uh, this fall at, um, at budget. Uh, yes, uh, uh, so I just want to confirm that 50% increase in total for the operating budget in the, over the four years. And right now the motion and $4.7 million uh, from FCR and just for 2022 for this year and in the two, for two months, uh, snow and ice control uh, for the uh, implementation enhancement. Is that correct? That's right, yes. So it would be ramping up staff, doing some hiring and training. Um, the, the focus in the first year would be um, hiring staff. 
uh, and, and ramping up our services uh, in starting s shortly. It would be within early fall uh, in order to be operational for when the snow um, does start falling. That does though, um, that would make it difficult for council not to approve a funding package for 23 to 26 because uh, we would so be bringing people on board. So if we, if we approve this almost over, uh, over 50, 50 million dollars increase in total uh, for the operating budget. But right now for this motion, we only identify the 2022 4.7 million dollars uh, implementation, <clears throat> financial implementation from FSR. So for other increase, for the rest of increase, uh, almost like the uh, over $40 million and $45 million will be uh, come from the tax supporters, from tax levy. And then how we can identify the funding resources. Uh, where is that funding resource from for those increase? So, Councillor, the the funding for this would come through the tax levy through a service package. So that uh, would be the the ongoing component. The, again, the 4.7 is just to deal with a service level change for the remainder of 2022. Oh, okay. So, uh, so we'll be at the phase two, the over four years, not only one years, but all the increase. Correct. The bu the budget uh, amount in the uh, deliberation would be over the next budget cycle, uh, and that would be the full discussion. Okay, <clears throat> because if you do the just basic math and one hundred eleven uh point five million dollars and subtract fifty five or fifty seven point one million dollars, that's almost fifty four million dollars, an increase in total, and so that means is a larger, uh, almost a larger, three, over 3% 3 increase for the property tax. Yeah, we have, um, we have that broken down over um, winter seasons. And so it's, it was roughly 1.9% in the first year, 0.66% in the second, 054 in the third, uh, and a final 0.4% in the, in the fourth year. Uh, so that overall oh, increase that you're referring to would be spread out that, over the four years. That, that's his different number. Thank you. I'm I sorry, Councillor Rice, that's, that's yeah. five minutes. Okay, so that is my question. I, I just want uh, to get a very clear understanding for the financial implement, okay. implementation. Okay, thank you. And this is, a, this is committee recommending to council. So this will go to council next week for a final vote. Okay, any other questions? Anyone to speak to the motion? Councillor Knack? Yes, uh, thank you, Councillor Cartmel. Just very quickly, so there will be no shock uh, next week. Uh, I, I mean, we need to do this. I, I'd actually prefer option A, so uh, appreciate option B is, is better than nothing, but most likely when it comes to council, I'll, I'll just select it for voting purposes and, and likely vote no as I, my per preference would be to go to option A. Um, I, I just don't wanna, and it's it's a very reasonable position to go to option B, but I think this is uh, such an important core service that has been severely underfunded for um, far too long. And I'd, I'd like to right that wrong uh, sooner rather than later. So I think it's worth um, advancing a bit more from the FSR in one year. Uh, and, you know, of course, if we didn't have a, a massive snowfall year, there's a potential that uh, you might not incur that in overall cost. But uh, appreciate option B is not an unreasonable piece, but, but uh, when folks see me vote against it at council, uh, it, it's solely about uh, pace. I prefer to go to option A. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else to speak? Okay, well, just to close then very quickly, um, the reason I... Uh, decided to put option B on the floor was that it, it is something, but it's not everything, and recognizing that it's really a three-month solution set. It's uh, it's not a forever thing. Um, if there's a desire amongst council when we get to the four-year budget to move at a much faster pace, or alternatively, at a much slower pace, uh, that can all come out in the four-year. 
uh, but in recognition that we do have to do more than we've been doing, that essentially this budget has been frozen for many years uh, while our city has grown around us. Uh, I thought that we should at least put some resources into getting started on, on improving the service now. Um, this 4.7 would support an R0.5 or an R1 approach. Uh, either one is, is available. Um, and if there's a desire amongst uh, the majority of councillors to move at a faster pace, well, we've only really lost three months by approving uh, this middle ground approach. So that was my reasoning and thinking. Uh, so hopefully committee will support this and it will go to council and uh, be considered without a lot of debate there. Thank you. Please vote. We have five votes. Please display the vote. That's carried, so we'll speak about that again at council. Thank you. That takes us now to item 6.8, Vehicle for Hire Bylaw Amendment. Thank you, Mr. McCown and Mr. Sebrick, for your work on that. Uh, good morning, members of committee. My apologies uh, for a moment there as I was getting myself sorted. Uh, we're here today with a uh, vehicle for hire bylaw amendment, and I'm going to pass the floor to Lila Peter, uh, Peters to give a, a bit of an overview of what's in the bylaw amendment before you today. Lila. Thank you, Stephanie. In March 2022, taxi industry dispatchers and drivers raised concerns regarding significant increases in operating costs specifically the recent increase in retail gasoline prices. Over the past year, retail gasoline prices in the Edmonton region have increased at double digit rates. The city's vehicle for hire bylaw sets a minimum fare for the transportation network providers such as Uber. And this has resulted in those providers having the flexibility to adjust their fares to changing market conditions. However, the bylaw currently strictly regulates taxi fares at a static rate, and this has prevented taxis from having the flexibility to appropriately adjust to these market conditions. It should also be noted that there has not been a review of the fares since 2007. I'll share our plans to review the fares momentarily. Administration has engaged with dispatchers and taxi drivers to understand the impact of the increased operating costs. Industry, represent uh, industry representatives have expressed that it is becoming increasingly difficult for dispatchers and operators to retain taxi drivers. Administration is proposing an optional fuel surcharge of up to 13.29% that may be applied to fares, which has been calculated based on the average fuel price increase and then adjusted to the percentage of overall costs that fuel represents to drivers. This is presented as an optional surcharge with a cap of a 13.29% increase. In practice, this would result in taxis being able to charge anywhere between the current base rate and up to and including the proposed rate. We note that the optional and range-based nature of the proposed surcharge is a shift away from fixed rates that currently exist for the taxi industry. Administration recognizes the potential impact of temporarily increased fees on taxi users, specifically those on low or fixed incomes. The optional surcharge would allow industry the flexibility to adjust their fares with those sensitivities in mind and in consideration of their own unique assessments of balancing driver retention with the impact on their user groups. Administration will monitor retail gas prices and if these prices return to or fall below the average price of, uh, of 129.9 per litre for two consecutive quarters, administration will return to council for further direction. As noted, a comprehensive vehicle for hire fare review has not been conducted since 2007. And so administration has begun this work, which includes a GBA plus analysis and will result in significant engagement with all of our industry and user stakeholders. 
The outcome from this overarching fair review will return to Council in 2023 as required. Thank you, and we are happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. We'll now hear from our speakers. And so I'd ask um, the following speakers to step forward. We'll uh, just have you sit in the seats up here at the front table if you're here. May we also have a motion to add our I'm oh, sorry, yeah, speaker? I was just going to do that, uh, Thank Madam you. Clerk. So I, uh, we do have an additional speaker. Um, and so I uh, will move that we also hear from Prasan Kumar. Please vote. We have five votes. Please display the vote. That's carried. So we'll have first speaker is DeWinder Dale. Second, uh, Brett Bain. Is Mr. Bain here? In the second chair, if you could. Uh, number three, Philip Strong. Uh, number four, Uday Kumar, who had registered to join us remotely. Not sure if Mr. Kumar is with us. Uh, and then fifth is Krasan Kumar. But I'm not sure if that's remote or in person. I believe right, we'll Krasan's go. remote. And do we have Abdul Mohammed as well? I do not have an Abdul Mohammed. Oh, apologies. Let me double check my list. Uh, no, I have a list from yesterday. This is who we approved, though. My so do we apologies. need another motion, then? Yes, apologies. Abdul Mohammed, who's in person. Abdul Mohammed. Uh, okay, so I'll move that we hear from uh, Abdul Mohammed as well. As part of our speakers, please vote. Please display the vote. Sorry. Just looking for Mayor Sorry. Sohi's vote. It's my fault. We have five votes. Please display the vote. That's carried. Uh, okay. So let's begin with uh, DeWinder Dale. Please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everybody. And thank you very much. So my name is Devinder Deo, and I will speak on behalf of uh, United Taxi Group for uh, drivers, taxi drivers of Edmonton. Uh, things uh, in uh, taxi industry are not as simple as outlined in the agenda. As uh, uh, briefed already, taxi fare last time was reviewed in 2007, and thereafter it has not been reviewed or raised. But uh, the factor, various factor, uh, which control taxi services uh, kept on increasing one by one. Gasoline is not the only factor. Uh, dispatch fees uh, is one of the important factor. Uh, dispatch uh, fees is the, the payment which uh, we pay to the dispatch company. That's for the insurance. It's a commercial insurance and for the other dispatch services. I don't have data from 2007, but I have data from 2011. From 2011 till uh, this year, 2022, dispatch fees has increased 42%. And then the logistic, uh, in order to provide taxi service, we need to have logistic like a cab or a vehicle. Cost of vehicle has increased 80%. Non-hybrid vehicle used to be $20,000 in 2007, and now it has gone up to 30 6,000. Hybrid, 25,000. Now it has gone as high as 38,000. So this is 80% increase uh, uh, in the cost of vehicle, which you need to have in order to provide service. Gas, that's also uh, one of the factor, but that is not the only factor. Gas has gone from 96 cent per liter to $1.89, uh, which is 96% up at the present time from the year of 2007. Then maintenance cost. 
maintenance cost has gone as much as 100% up. It used to be something around $250 per month. Now it's as much as high as $500 per month. And we know hourly wages uh, uh, from were in 2007 were $8.40, which is right minimum. I'm talking about the minimum, which is not $15. So if we take the average of all these things, the dispatch fees, cost of vehicle, gas, and maintenance linearly, spread, uh, uh, giving equal importance to all the factors, this goes as high as 79%. So as a matter of fact, uh, taxi fare should be increased 79% from 2007. Can we do, we can't do it, because we have to compare uh, taxi fare of Edmonton with the surrounding jurisdiction. That we did, we did that XI. And uh, comparing with the other jurisdiction, Calgary, Red Deer, Lethbridge, Vancouver, Victoria, Regina, and Saskatoon, uh, a meeting uh, uh, was uh, conducted uh, uh, of all taxi uh, uh, stakeholder, including drivers, representation from association from our side, and all three taxi companies. And we uh, came, uh, uh, we come up uh, with uh, a proposal, which we have already submitted to the city. Uh, there we are uh, uh, looking for a drop rate of $3.90 in the beginning. And thereafter, uh, for uh, 135 meter uh, um, distance, it's a 25 cent, uh, and 25 cent for 24 second. So that uh, becomes uh, something like 21.1% uh, for a ride of three kilometer, I mean uh, around 20% uh, from uh, uh, the previous existing rate, uh, which is uh, $3.60 uh, uh, drop rate, and uh, uh, thereafter, it's a 20 cent drop for each 30, 135 meter, and 20 cent drop for each 24 second. That is what we are looking for, that the range has to be something around 20% in order to meet with the meet with these expenditures. And if we don't do, and what it has already resulted, that I'm going to uh, explain. Because in the survey, if you check, uh, they, they say in the survey that something like 52% of the driver, they are ready to quit. They have expressed their willingness not to continue uh, with the taxi services anymore if the fare is not changed or their economic situation does not change, which doesn't look like changing, right? So if uh, I give you the figure, it's a very disturbing, grim uh, situation through which the drivers are passing. Per week operating cost of a taxi, per week is the unit which we use in the taxi instead of month, that is coming as, including gasoline and everything, that is coming as high as $900. And what the dri drivers are collecting from the fare collection of her whole week after putting 72 hours in each week, six days, 12 hours, that is coming around $1,320. And if I take the, uh, what they are making at the end, they make something like $450 each week. So that uh, becomes uh, per month something around $2,000. And if we check uh, uh, with the, uh, the money which you have to spend, uh, if you are even a single person, uh, per uh, single person, that comes something around uh, $2,431. So if, even if you are a single, you can't afford to live in the city of Edmonton by driving taxi. By driving taxi, you can't. But if it's a family of four, you, you can hardly live. You have to borrow money from somewhere. And that's the reason that many drivers, either they are quitting or they are partially working. So as, as a matter of fact, uh, many of our taxi Thank licenses. Thank you. I'm sorry, sir. That's uh, five minutes is up. So I'm sorry. OK, I'll yeah, continue. There, there's, I should have uh, reminded everyone that there's five minutes each to speak and there's timers on the screen to, to guide you in that, okay? Uh, but I'm sure there'll be questions for you, sir. Uh, uh, to Mr. Bain, please go ahead, thank you. Uh, good morning, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Brett Bain, I'm representing the Edmonton International Airport this morning. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak with you today. Uh, we want to commend administration for their quick response to a fairly significant problem within the taxi industry. As you'll know, Canadians are beginning to travel again and the elimination of COVID protocols has seen the airport returning back to very close to pre-COVID numbers. We are, are experiencing some significant issues with taxis at the airport as increasing numbers of people begin to travel again. Prior to COVID, this was not an issue for our airport. The uh, industry continues to struggle as brokers are working hard to restore the previous driver levels which we had. 
with significant changes to insurance regulation, increasing cost for fuel and maintenance, and cost of living increases, it's becoming increasingly difficult for drivers to earn a living wage from their work. While no one wants to pay more for the same service, the reality is without an increase in rates, it's anticipated that more than 50% of the current driving fleet will be out of the business by the end of 2022. As such, we are supportive of the industry to meet the realities uh, and provide the increase to meet the realities of the current environment for the industry. Normally, uh, we would review not only pricing, but the zone rates themselves uh, as the flat rate zone structure is a component of the bylaw today. We don't want to stop this important pricing adjustment. However, we may want to come back to you in the future to recertify a new zone map. Um, you know, uh, additionally, we would also recommend an examination of vehicle standards as the bylaw is a bit out of step with newer vehicle and changes within the industry over the last number of years. Given the significant problem with vehicle purchasing today, we would also recommend some relaxation of, relaxation of these vehicle standards in the shorter term to allow the industry to grow as the industry has no way to procure some of the vehicles listed within the standard for both taxis and limousines. As the airport, uh, we certainly commit to working with the city in the future, if you so choose, uh, to help provide some guidance on new standards and vehicle types within the bylaw. Thank you again for the opportunity today to speak with you and provide some feedback, and I'd certainly be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you very much. Thank you for that. Our next speaker is, is Uday Kumar with us? Oh, is it Philip Strong? Yeah, please go ahead. Uh, could I have my presentation, please? Um, good morning, I'm Phil Strong, I operate Yellow Cab and its affiliated uh, companies. Um, as you have heard, we're losing drivers and yet a lot of people are making a living trying to work with uh, the taxi industry. It's a local, people stay in town as opposed to Uber, none of our money disappears in other jurisdictions. Next slide, please. So today, for the sake of the new members of council, I'm going to approach these four subjects. Why was the vehicle for hire bylaw created? Why is the public not protected? Why is Edmonton always the cheapest taxi rate in Alberta? Why can't taxi drivers recover their costs increased since 2007? Next slide, please. So initially, the, the bylaw was created to regulate taxi fares and vehicle conditions. This is in order to, um, to safeguard the public and, and provide pricing certainty. What was happening is everybody could set their own price. It was a race to the bottom. Maintenance of vehicles wasn't happening because drivers couldn't make a living wage and it became a dangerous environment. Next slide, please. Why is the public not protected in the current uh, proposal it's an optional increase and this is not doesn't make sense in a regulated community we all have to charge the same price throughout the industry a customer should not have to phone around all different companies to see what the price is going to be it should be a flat rate I'll tell you there's people that get into the cab on fixed incomes that have the money in their hand they know what the cab ride's already going to be today and they give it to the driver if he's 10 cents out there's trouble but that's the nature of the business it can't be uh optional we're not uber we're taxi companies and taxis have fixed rates next slide please so even even with the the minimal amount of of increase we're giving which we'll debate on exactly how much it is we're still behind calgary by 13.8 percent red deer by 16.7 percent vancouver by 16 percent saskatoon by 26 percent we're the cheapest city in western canada for taxi rates and i don't know why we have to be it's because we're not probably our system isn't moving fast enough we're not evaluating the, the taxi licenses quick enough, uh, the rates, I mean. Next slide, please. 
So my cost uh, figures are a little bit different than, than my colleague down the way here, but I'll assure you all my numbers, I can forward proof of how I got them. If requested, I can transcribe my notes, but automotive shop rate has gone up 43% since 2007. The weekly average cost of regular gasoline has gone up 59%. Insurance costs have gone up 65%. And a Toyota Camry LE V6 has gone up 60.8% since 2007. Next slide, please. So in closing, I want to mention that on page 286 of your report where the new rates are outlined is flawed. The math is flawed. I don't blame the vehicle for hire. They're not familiar with the industry. But you can't have a meter starting at $4.08. All rates in the taxi industry have to start, show dimes, and or components of dimes. Otherwise, there's always an argument if the rate's $15.38, you have to round up or round down. It causes friction within the industry. The meter has to read in dimes. So I've set this, I've done my calculations that based on, on these numbers and the report, the drop should be 410. It should be a 20 cent increment for every 117.39 meters and a 20 cent increment for every 21 seconds of, of uh, hourly components. And that translates to 11.69% increase. I don't know where the city got to 3.2. I'm willing to meet with them. But here's the most important thing. We can't stall this. We gotta move ahead with it. So I'll accept anything that I can get for now, but we can't wait till 23 for the next review. We gotta go in October where traditionally we've come to council every October. Great, thank you, Mr. Strong. Uh, is Uday Kumar with us? Sorry if I missed it early. Yes, okay. Uh, so Uday. Mr. Kumar. I can see that they're online and that they've unmuted. Oh, and they've muted now. I wonder if there might be a technical issue, if they might want to. Hello. Oh, perfect. Oh, okay. Please go ahead. Uh, I am not Uday Kumar. My name is uh, Christian Kumar. Oh, apologies. We have you um, as number six on our list. Well, that's okay. Go ahead. Go you. Please go ahead. Okay. Uh, am I allowed to speak now? Yes. Please go ahead, sir. You have five minutes. Go ahead. Okay. So, uh, my name is uh, Krishan Kumar, and I uh, I started uh, driving co-op taxi now, and I have talked to many other drivers, yeah. and I myself. Uh, have uh, I have I myself uh, no notice some of the issue that the taxi drivers are facing. Uh, I have there are many concerns, but uh, few con few are the major concern. I want to bring in your notice. Uh, first one is because oil prices has increased more than double. Earlier, it used to be around uh, 80 to 95 cents. Now it is uh, $1.90. So the uh, oil price has increased more than double and our fare is uh, still same. So it, it's coming out of our pocket and it, uh, like uh, it, it's uh, our income is getting low and low. Second, my second, so I want, uh, I think the oil, uh, the fair price should be increased. Uh, in my guess, 50 cents a kilometer or whatever is reasonable. Uh, 
sec my second issue is uh, during uh, uh, during busy hours and uh, event days, the other uh, company like Uber and other ride sharing companies they are uh, taking surcharge. They are charging uh, surcharge to their customer, which is uh, which is from their perspective is okay, but we as a taxi company are also giving the same kind of service, and we are not allowed to uh, uh, for surcharge, and uh, so I think uh, taxi. Uh, company should also be given the same fair opportunity like Uber. And I think uh, the customer also don't mind paying extra fare uh, during busy hours. And since we are working very hard, we need some extra money during busy hours. So I think uh, Taxi uh, companies should also get search charges during event days and busy hours. My third concern is uh, about the cancellation charge. The taxi uh, driver do not get cancellation charge if a customer cancels the ride. And uh, uh, Uber is charging uh, uh, ca cancellation charge uh, if the uh, customer is cancels the ride, and uh, with taxi customer is not liable to do that. So uh, I have noticed personally. I have noticed that uh, customer uh, orders uh, two three different taxis uh, same time. And whoever comes first, they take that taxi and go, and later on they cancel other taxi. Which, uh, like for other driver, they uh, they use gas and time, and they get nothing for this. So that is one of the major issue. So I think customers should be charged for cancellation charge. And uh, my fourth issue is like uh, we need uh, more taxi plates. I request the city to issue more taxi plates so there could be more taxi on the road. And we can, since we are uh, one of the oldest, uh, like, uh, uh, um, uh, taxi uh, tech, uh, for people, taxi services. So we should be given more opportunity and uh, fair chance as a uh, ride sharing company. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your thank comments, you. Mr. Kumar. Appreciate that. Our final speaker is uh, Abdul Mohammed. Apologies, there is Uday on the line as well. I believe they've joined by um, phone. Uh, okay, well, we're at the lunch break then, so um, what's the will of council? Oh, pardon me, of uh, committee? Uh, do we want, to, okay, well, so uh, I'll move that we, I'm really reluctant to do this, but I'll move that we extend orders to hear from the final two speakers. I just don't like having our staff missing their lunch break. Uh, they'll have to come back for questions anyway, so, yeah. Okay, so uh, we'll, I, we'll adjourn at this point then. That's We've reached our, uh, our noon adjournment, and uh, we'll pick up with the final speakers at 1.30, uh, then have questions of our speakers, and then questions of administration. Okay, thank you. See you at 1.30.
He will be back with us shortly. I'll just look to the clerk. I believe we have two speakers remaining from this session. Am I correct? Correct. And uh, so I could invite at this time uh, Mr. Kumar and Mr. Mohammed to join at the table. And Mr. Kumar, you would have five minutes. Uh, a point, point of order. Do oh. we want to do a roll call? I'm sorry, I, I couldn't hear you. Uh, do we want to do a roll call? I oh. just want to indicate that I'm, I'm online. So. Oh, thank you. Yes, good point. Um, I'll do the roll call. Um, Council Wright? Yes. Mayor Sohi? I'm here. Councilor Tang? I'm here. And I'll look to the clerk. Are there any other members? Yes, it looks like Councilor Knack is online. Councilor Knack? Good afternoon. As well as Councilor Stevenson? And Councilor Stevenson. And Councilor Principe. Councilor Principe? Hello. Okay. All right. Duly noted. I'll uh, look to the clerk then. Can we give uh, um, guest Kumar five minutes? So it'll be Uday Kumar, and I believe they are online. Oh, thank you. Yes, I'm here. Can you, can you hear me? Yep, you have the floor. Hello, everyone. My name is Uday Kumar. I'm the CEO of Alberta Co-op Taxi Line Limited. Thank you for giving me uh, this opportunity to speak about the meter rate increase in city of Edmonton. The report provided by the vehicle for hire team is stating the months of April and prior to that. After those months, the gas prices increased tremendously. Example, $1.90 after the report was done. And there is no guarantee the gas prices will not go beyond this. With the city proposed optional rate increase, we believe it is not the proper term to use and it shouldn't be the temporary fix for our industry. By giving a short-term surcharge, it is not a viable solution for this issue the taxi industry is facing. After the City Council recommendations, the dispatchers in the City of Edmonton worked with the drivers and provided some options based on the gasoline prices and current cost of living. It is very disappointing that the vehicle for hire team has come up with some temporary increase that can fluctuate at any second and also not even 60% increase of what we proposed. The gas prices were doubled, the insurance cost was doubled, the vehicle cost was doubled. I don't know why we struggled to this extent to get the rates increased. The basic wages went high more than four times in the last 15 years. And my point is, why do the normal taxi driver have to struggle with the economic situations like this? In my opinion, rates need to be re-reviewed re uh, considering the broker's recommendations and also permanent meter increase need to be adopted as soon as possible so we can help the struggling drivers. I expect we will be in top of the two positions with the coming meter rate increase as we are increasing our rates after 15 years. And I expect a dynamic structure to be put in place so the rates can be reviewed after two, for every two years going forward. Thanks for your time on this matter. Thank you very much. Um, now, uh, Mr. Abdul Mohammed. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, first of all, I just want to say after coming back two years and a half, congratulations, our new mayor, Sohi. And I like to, um, I always work with, uh, uh, with DO, Succession, and I work Yellow Cup, our bus behind. Uh, and one thing issue is this one's about, uh, we had a back in the days uh, surcharge and it was 660 and the people they were public complain and we took it out. So now what I see in it, we taxi drivers, if you see last week and whole winter, you see a lot of, it could be your own son and students, everybody, what's out there uh, overcharging, it's just really unbelievable. And if you come and work on the Saturday or in the winter time on last weekend, the places we go for twenty dollar, they were going for eighty dollar. Places we go for thirty five dollar, they were going hundred and forty dollar, and they were complaining back in the days. I just want to know why, and nobody going behind. And sometimes me, I charge people can Canadian entire money if they don't have no money enough. You know, it's just you look after the. People and the, with the COVID, people coming, no, they don't have enough money and all this kind of stuff. And please, like the only thing I'm just saying, we have a, our uh, taxi drive companies who has been there, a yellow cab, seven years, helping the city of Edmonton. And I feel so sorry 
what's going on out there, nobody increasing anything for how many years, and co-op, they've been 50 years, and who's original company who helped this city? You gotta be proud, you have a Canadian owners who's out there, and the only thing I'm just saying, me, I do all the kind of help, I work with clubs, I do everything, taxi driver, I do sports, but what I see out there is just really, you gotta come, solution and look the student in the winter time uber charge so much money and they all line up last weekend why are they lining up they waiting everybody taxi come back they don't want to take over thank you very much god bless thank you i'll look to the clerk does this conclude our speakers yes we would now ask questions of the speakers excellent i look to the committee um please buzz in if you would like to ask questions of the speakers Seeing no questions. Oh, okay, we're just. Councillor, I'll go to Councillor Wright then. Councillor Wright, would you like to start? There I am. Oh, you exempted it. Yeah, you're up first. Yes, please. Thank you. Um, so I, I'm just wondering about the, um, the optional um, part of this uh, amendment. And so how, how would patrons know in advance if, um, you know, if their driver was actually going to be charging them that extra, or, or getting the benefit of that, or sorry, being charged that extra amount, that 1329, I think it is. I guess if it's optional, one company could add 13% to their fares, and another company could add six, and one company could add three, and the customer would have to phone all companies to see what their rate is. Okay. And that's not feasible. A, it'll increase everybody's call center activity for no good business reason. Okay, so would it be more fair and equitable if it was just um, standard applied across yeah. the board? Since I've been in the business since 1980, and we've always had a fixed rate. Yeah. That's why it's a regulated industry. The, the public has to know what they're paying. Okay, yeah, and I think that that's fair. Um, I'm, I'm looking at, at putting forward an amendment um, and I'll, I'll look for some guidance from our law department on that to, to make it a, a fixed rate across the board then. Okay, and that's all the questions I have. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councilor Wright. Uh, Mayor Sohi. Yeah, th thank you, uh, each and every one of you for, uh, for being here today and obviously understand the, uh, the cost pressures uh, from, uh, you know, dispatcher fees to insurance cost to uh, vehicle purchase and maintenance cost and gas cost. Uh, and the fares not being adjusted since 2007. So what I would like to understand is that would you, uh, if this is approved and consistency or inconsistency is dealt with by having the optional choice removed, would you like to move forward on that until the bigger question about adjusting the overall fares is considered. So Mr. maybe to Mr. Dio, is that the approach you would like to do or you would like to have a fair review first, then move or, or then come have an approach? Yeah. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, actually, there is a lot of confusion uh, in the text uh, of the agenda. It looked like uh, that uh, that a fair 13.29% will stay until the gas price stays there. Once the gas price drops, that that uh, that uh, surcharge uh, or the fare increase will vanish, right? So everybody in the industry is scared that we will be back to scare one. But the next uh, revision, the actual revision, when it will take place, there is it's not time specific. They say it will be uh, first quarter of next year, mean okay. before April. So that look like quite a longer time. What we, as we discussed, I discussed with Phil Strong and other colleagues, uh, they want it uh, until October, before the winter starts. Uh, let's go by 13.29% right now, and it stays. It should not only be connected with the increase in gasoline prices, oh, because see. there are a few other things. It's not only the gasoline price. Oh, gasoline price is one of the factors. Oh, right? It. So it stays, and on the top of 13.29%, let there will be another reason. As we have put forward uh, uh, the proposal format uh, to vehicle for hire, which sees uh, uh, for a smaller ride of 3 kilometers, 20% increase. Let's go up, up to 20%. So, combined. You, so you would like to see this be 
this in increase remain in place. Yeah. And then and and then expedite the other conversations to be yeah. dealt with by October, right? Yeah, by October. Okay, yes. okay. So we'll, we'll ask that question to a uh, to administration. My understanding is then again we'll ask this to legal, is that if this is approved, if this increase is approved, in order to uh, take away that increase, there would have to be another bylaw amendment yeah. uh, that will come to a, a for council's consideration. It's not automatic removal. Uh, removal. Mm -hmm. we'll, we'll seek that clarity. That's my understanding. Yeah. Now, once again, thank you so much for uh, for being here today. Really appreciate you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Mayor. Yeah. Thank you. Seeing, uh, oh, Councillor Tang. Thank you. Um, my question is to Mr. Bang from the EIA, if he's still there. Um, he's there? Oh. Yes. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, I think I heard, uh, yeah, I heard, um, by the way, thank you to all of you for, for coming out and spending the time and waiting over lunch uh, and returning. Um, I, I think I, I wanted to get some clarity on on the piece that you were saying kind of towards the end there. Uh, you don't want to see this current bylaw change be slowed down, but you might also come back with more suggestions on the standards to help the industry as a whole. Um, and I was just wanting you to, if you can uh, clarify, are, are you talking about, you know, things like fair review, uh, kind of like what, what the Mr. Mayor was mentioning just just now? Or did you have other things in mind? Well, I think, uh, thank you very much for your question. Um, I, I think that there are some uh, anomalies within the, within the industry itself that have not kept pace with the current standard today. Uh, as an example, when, um, when uh, private transportation providers were licensed in 2016 and 2017, um, in some cases, uh, some of the services and some of the ground transportation products that were offered kind of disappeared into the woodwork, as an example, uh, black car service. So black, you know, limousines exist within the bylaw, but they're not clearly defined. Black car service doesn't really fit within the parameters of uh, PTP, nor does it fit in the parameters of a taxi or a limo limousine service, which can be different. I so see, okay. I, I think that there's just some adjustments that are required to, to look at those, at those bylaws. The other piece that I spoke of was, you know, the problem, one of the problems the industry is, is facing right now is the complete lack of supply of vehicles. So the difficulty that they're yes. having, we want to be able to service people who come to the airport. We want to be able to service citizens in the yes. city who require those services, but we're having the brokers and the, uh, the operators of those businesses uh, are having problems procuring vehicles that meet okay. the standard established because Great. they Thank simply you. can't get them. Dane, thank you for, for clarifying that. That definitely answered my, my question. Um, and then I guess a question to Mr. Mohammed. Um, so I guess I just want to also clarify on, on your on your ask, do you are you supportive of of the surcharge or are you just, you know, because there's a lot of concerns you you express about affordability? I'm not supporting can... surcharge, but I'm just worried about the students out there and other people who are competing with us over what's going on out there. That's what I'm just worried about. I can't charge even me, uh, no surcharge back in the days, public complaint, and we don't even charge anymore. But we just need to be equal. And if, thing, if they charging all this money, and it could be your son, your daughter out there, you come outside, in the winter time, you're gonna see it. Thank you very much, that's the only thing. Yeah, and, 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 and you, um, I apologize. I think I missed your introduction there, but you are um, you are a taxi driver yourself. Yes, I'm driving. I'm at the same time I drive taxi and I promote clubs. But the only thing I'm drive taxi, I seen it. What's out there? That's the only thing I'm just saying. Uh, what's out there? This is very tough for the students and the public. That's the only thing. I see. Um, so I okay. Thank you for uh, for for sharing your perspective. Uh, I I think it's quite 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 unique. Um, okay, uh, Mr. Kumar, uh, um, yes. I, you've unmuted yourself and you would like to respond. Um, yes. I'll give you your last minute. Uh, I, uh, I, uh, my concern is the same as uh, the earlier speaker, that uh, uh, everybody should be given a fair chance, like 
Uber drivers and taxi driver because they are doing same thing. So, uh, like, there should be a fair platform for everyone. That's all I want to say. Thank you, man. Sorry, back to you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councillor Tang. Um, seeing no further speakers in the queue, we now go to questions of administration. I understand that there may be an amendment coming as well, so uh, maybe we'll kick it off. Councillor Wright, do you have a question of administration? Or do you want to move the amendment now and put it forward? Um, I'm going to look to the clerk because I did get some advice. I'm going to look to the clerk because I did get some advice. Should I? I can put what I have in the chat if that's helpful. Okay. Okay, and thank you to our speakers. You can, um, yeah, we'll, we'll just continue with the debate then. Appreciate you coming forward today. Um, sorry, uh, Council Wright, the floor is still yours. Thank you. Okay, so I guess a uh, question to, um, uh, to legal here. Um, my idea was to just remove the word optional, but that provides some concerns, does it? I say it's concerns, it's a logistical challenge. What we would need, what I would suggest to you is we can achieve that outcome, absolutely, but refer it back to administration with the direction to effectively make it not optional. We'll return on Monday with a revised bylaw that does that. It's just a complicated motion to do on the fly. Okay, um, so I will then move um, that bylaw 20186, vehicle for hire bylaw amendment as outlined in the June 27th, 2022 Urban Planning and Economy Report, UPE 01273 be referred back to administration to revise Schedule A to set out the exact fares to be charged by taxis and accessible taxis, including the propo proposed fuel surcharge and return to the July 4th, 6th, 2022 City Council meeting. I'll look to the clerk. Do you have a copy of the wording? Yep, it's on its way to the board. Excellent. Do you want to introduce it, Councillor Wright? No. Okay. Um, so I, I just think by removing the, the word um, optional uh, makes it fairer for all that um, patrons and, and, uh, and drivers and cab companies all know what, what the fares will be. Um, but as has been explained, um, just doing that might be a little bit of a logistical nightmare. So, um, so I will look to legal then to revise that uh, bylaw and uh, bring that forward to council on Monday. Okay, thank you. So we have a motion to refer on the floor. Are there any questions, Councillor Tang? Yeah, some questions for administration to to on the report itself. Okay, go um, ahead. I guess I'm just wondering why the decision for optional to begin with. Uh, Councillor Tang, we heard from our engagement with the industry that there was a uh, desire for more flexibility around the fare structure. And as you heard, there's been quite some time since we've reviewed the fare structure. So uh, based on the engagement, that's the reason why we proceeded that way. So uh, so is, is the intention that uh, for this particular bylaw on the, on the fuel surcharge to help alleviate the immediate concern um and so optional but then when we do a like a proper fair review uh which i think is next year if you can clarify a timeline and then you will kind of take all this into consideration is that is that what you're what you're saying that's correct Councillor tang we're here today with this bylaw because of the emerging issue associated with uh fuel uh fuel prices um for taxi drivers and we will return to committee in Q1 of 2023 with our annual work plan. And as part of that annual work plan, we'll give you an idea when we'll be able to do a comprehensive fair review. We know we need to do one. And um, based on some of the feedback just even heard today in terms of we need to move that up earlier, uh, say October this year, what's your, what's, I guess, just any feedback on that? Um, at this point, we've been focused um, on mandatory training and enhanced service opportunities as discussed when we brought our annual work plan forward at the beginning of this year. And so if committee would like to give us direction to uh, focus on something different, we would be willing to uh, change the work plan. But right now we are working on mandatory training. Okay. Uh, that was related to the the previous vehicle for hire discussion, right? That's correct. Right. Although in in, in that discussion, we, I, I guess I just 
feel the, 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 the fair aspect is, is quite different um, from that discussion. It's quite different, but it's the same people doing the work. It's the vehicle yes. for hire team that's doing the work, engaging with the industry. And yeah. so that's where we're focused right now. And we will have part of, as part of our 2023 work plan, we will have a comprehensive fair review as part of that work plan. It's just about the timing of it. Gotcha. So this way we kind of spread the, the workload a, a little bit more evenly. I appreciate that. Um, I I guess I had, yeah, I, I did have a question too. Um, and maybe if you can educate me on this, so how does this apply to, to the ride share fares? Or it wouldn't? It doesn't. Ms. Peter, can you add some more additional detail on how we deal with ride share? Sure, ride share um, has their own fuel, uh, fuel, their own fare structure. And so they don't have the maximum rate, which is why you've heard many um, individuals today who speak about the um, surge pricing that Uber is able to provide. Um, and this is why we um, felt the need to come to committee today is we wanted to um, amend that base rate reflecting the current fuel prices for taxis. Thank, thank you. Okay, that is much clearer to me now. Um, yeah, I, I think, I, you know, one of the questions I have is a bit, a bit of a long term that I'm hoping might be addressed through a proper fair review, but just how might we be more responsive in the long term uh, to, you know, fluctuating fuel, you know, fuel costs, not to mention there, there are other components, but it also sounds to me, if we undergo the fair review, you can capture a lot of those um, uncertainty, I suppose. Great observation, Councillor Tang, and absolutely the types of things that we're going to have to review uh, during a comprehensive fair review. Okay. Um, do you, I guess, I'm sorry, my last question then, um, sort of given what you've heard from, from the industry, um, not, not just today's uh, speakers, but you know, in your engagement, um, if we move forward with the intended amendment to not make it optional, but you know, kind of permanent, and then on top of that, do the fair fair review. What kind of unintended consequences has the team anticipated? I'm sorry, I didn't hear the last part of your. In what types of things did the team anticipate? Yeah, uh, unintended consequences. Unintended consequences. Um, Ms. Petrin or Ms. Peter, who've been involved in the engagement, uh, are there any unintended consequences if it's a mandatory? Um, I think when we proposed the optional, we were reflecting on the um, fluctuation of fuel prices over the past year, and they have risen, but they have been much lower. And so we wanted to make sure that if fuel prices did decrease, the users of the service weren't going to be paying a much higher fare when that fuel price was higher. We also are cognizant that because this was such a quick turnaround um, from the request coming in and to respond, that we haven't done fulsome engagement with the users of the service. We know that many of the people who use the service are on um, very limited or fixed incomes. And so applying a um, price increase without getting their input and then having it sustained even if fuel prices go down may be very impactful to them. And that's why we had largely proposed the optional. Perfect, thank you so much. Thank you, Councillor Tang. Uh, Mayor Sohi. Yeah, so just to follow up on that, uh, the if the fuel prices go down, there'll be a process to bring forward the bylaw again, right? Would that has to come to council? That's correct. It's just a matter of how quickly we could get that on an agenda. Right. Okay. But in the interim, until we do that comprehensive review on the uh, on the fair structure, uh, I understand this is a temporary relief, but. I understand the capacity issues as well. Is there a way to maybe expedite? I, I, I just want to know if there's capacity to expedite. Uh, we'll look at it for 2023 to perhaps put the comprehensive fair review earlier in our work plan than later in our work plan, but it's not something that we could address this year. Okay, because I understand Calgary made some permanent adjustments to their fair structure. I think about 13% they increased. Uh, to reflect, because they, they were in similar situation. The fares were not adjusted for, for quite a while. 
Uh, that's correct. They have also, in other, some other Canadian cities have made some changes. And so this is our proposal is that we do this fix. Yeah. Uh, and we will look at when we can get that body of work in, understanding the importance of that body of work. So temporary relief, then do the work, then make recommendations for permanent solutions to this. That's correct, and we're absolutely going to need to do engagement okay. on that and permanent engage solution. Engage with industry, engage with, engage with the drivers, and engagement public as well. That's correct. Oh, got it, okay. Uh, there was a question from one of the speakers that there's no cancellation fee charged if a trip is canceled without notice. But I see in the bylaw under uh, H and the old bylaw proposed uh, that the $3.60 charge. Is just an enforcement issue or is it, what is the challenge that, or is it brokers not enforcing that? Like, any, any insight into that? I believe it's a technology issue. Um, Ms. Peter, can you add more to it? There is no regulatory um, challenge there. Um, the companies could charge that fare. I wonder if it has to do with, the, as uh, Ms. McKay mentioned, with the um, technology. So with someone like Uber, you register your credit card and you book yeah. through there and they're able to automatically charge. Yeah. I'm not quite sure if all the companies have that technology in place, so if they're relying on payment okay. and not having a user profile yeah, set so up. So that's more of a techn technology, I mean, implementation issue, right? Not a, not a policy or regulation issue. I do believe so. Okay, got it, okay, yeah. good. I think that's important for, um, uh, for clarification. Okay, got it, thank you so much for this and uh, look forward to the, uh, the comprehensive review when that takes place and uh, and, uh, and looking forward to adjusting that rate. Okay, good, thank you. I see uh, we'll need a second round, so I'll move the second round. No need. Oh, no, no, we don't need that at a committee. Okay, game on then. Council Wright. Thank you. Um, I know Mr. Dio had a uh, concern in regards to the temporary nature of this um, in the event that gas prices were to go back down. Um, has there been sort of any interim forecasting? I've been trying to, to Google some information that it doesn't look like it will uh, before the full review is done. Uh, Ms. Petron or Ms. Peter, can you speak to any forecasting we did or any forecasting we have on fuel prices? Um, I'm not sure of that yet. Um, Ms. Heisey, do you have any forecasting from our economist on this? Yeah, essentially what we've heard is that it's just going to be so volatile. And so we, we will have a minimum of six months during that proposed two-quarter review period. Um, and it's just a lot of uncertainty moving into the first two quarters of 2023 on that front. Um, but I will note that the proposal uh, includes coming back to committee for direction. So there is flexibility there. Okay, so we, this is probably the best case scenario of just looking at the fuel prices that rather than having a specific cutoff of October. Councillor Wright, this is our best uh, advice to you at this point. Okay, thank you very much for that. Thank you. So we have a motion to refer on the floor. Uh, seeing no other speakers. Uh, Councillor Wright, do you want to close on the motion to refer? Oh, Mayor Sohi. Yeah, just quickly. Please. Uh, just to, uh, to make sure that everyone understands, uh, people who are listening and people are here, that what this committee is recommending is uh, uh, instead of being optional, it should be uh, a permanent, and uh, that the decision will be made by the bylaw amendments, the new, uh, what, uh, yeah, the amended bylaw will come to council, and council will make that decision uh, on July 4th and July 5th council meeting. So, uh, uh, so that everybody clear, uh, clear what is we'll be doing. So, so that's, so thank you, thank you, Councilor Wright for this, yeah. Excellent. Uh, Council rights close. No more needs to be said. Thank you. Okay. All right. Then I will call the question. Or I'll call the vote. Pardon me. We have four votes. Please display the vote. Okay. That carries unanimously. Um, thank you. We'll move on to the next item. To 6.11. Pardon me? 6.11. Uh, yes, we'll move on to item 611. Uh, could you remind me who selected this item? Oh, Mayor Sohi, excellent. 
Mayor Sohid to introduce you. Have five minutes. You're not in. You're not starting. Is there, do, is there a presentation? Uh, I'm not sure if administration has opening comments, but we'll just give the delegation want, a moment yeah. to come up. Okay. Yeah, we'll request a presentation. And Councillor Stevenson has joined the meeting. Is administration okay? Yes, I have a few opening comments. Great, please. Almost every major city is tackling altered crime and disorder patterns as we collectively emerge from the pandemic. People have been offering various solutions, more police, different policing, more community services, more treatment for mental health and addiction, more housing options. Enforcement agencies across Canada have deployed various tactics as they deal with what appear to be pandemic-related shifts in crime patterns, which have resulted in more vandalism, more assaults, confrontations in public places in some areas, more violence. They've shifted some of their resources to hot spots and to more visible patrols. In Edmonton, our response to the community tragedy experienced by Chinatown, we have worked closely with the community and partners in order to focus and deploy multiple layers of support, including an increased peace officer deployment. As we have surged our work in Chinatown, responding as quickly as our current capacity allows, we are hearing that positive and incremental change is being noticed. Our officers have shared that they have been approached during their shifts to be thanked for their increased visibility, positive presence, and thoughtful engagement. I can attest to the changes I've personally observed over the last number of weeks. Going through Chinatown has been part of my daily commute to City Hall. On Friday, June 3rd, I, along with Deputy City Manager of City Operations, Gord Sebrick, and Councillor Stevenson, spent two hours walking through the area with City of Edmonton peace officers and staff from the Government of Alberta focused on problem properties. On Friday, June 17 evening, I spent three hours walking about with an EPS sergeant and two patrol members, including the LRT. From what I observed and heard from the folks on the ground, things are improving. In addition to officers' visibility, there is a multitude of unseen teams that are working hard to address cleanliness and complete proactive work. I want to take this moment to express my gratitude for these integrated efforts to improve citizens' experiences of Chinatown. In addition to administration's adjustment, the Edmonton Police Service has launched phase one of Project Connection, which involves community members, sorry, community members and police connecting to identify problematic locations, situations, and individuals which require focused crime management initiatives. The motion we were, were, we were requested to answer with this report asked for resourcing options for expanding a COT-like model into specific business improvement areas. COT is a very effective model in the transit system and we are thankful for their excellent work. For a different space, we may need a different solution that caters to the community and its neighbours. What we are doing now in Chinatown is testing what works and what doesn't. We are keenly aware that during this time, we need to be monitoring the effectiveness of the model completing an evaluation post-deployment. To that end, administration will report back in October on our learnings on the sustainability of the model and whether additional resources and what kind of resources are required to continue hyper-localized surge work in the future. As a final note regarding resourcing, I had the opportunity this morning before committee to go to the Alberta Solicitor General's Training Academy to address the Community Peace Officer Recruit class. Ten of these recruits have been hired by the City of Edmonton, nine will be transit peace officers, and one will go to animal care. During their introductions, I was so impressed to hear the passion and commitment they will bring to this challenging work. You've all been invited to attend their graduation on the afternoon of Tuesday, July 12th, and I hope you'll be able to find time in your schedule to welcome them to the city. I had to do a plug. Thank you, and we're pleased to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Mayor Sohi, you selected it. Yeah, Apologies, thank you so much. Apologies, we do have a public speaker. Uh, Thank you. Could you, is this uh, Ms. Carrier? Correct. Uh, yeah, May is. Uh... Hi there. Um, my name is Cassie Carrier. Um, I, I'm uh, supposed to be presenting right now. Uh, Wonderful. You I'm have five minutes. Sure. Okay. Um, hello. So uh, just give me one second. Sorry. Uh, 
Uh, okay. Uh, all right. So. Uh, good afternoon, and thank you for this opportunity to present. Uh, I'm very grateful to be here with you all today. Uh, my name is Cass Carrier. I'm a grade nine student from John D. Bracco School in Northeast Edmonton. I am here today with uh, uh, one other student from my class, um, and her name is Elizabeth Wall. And I'm actually here with, uh, um, yeah, so just one student. Uh, I will be speaking from now uh, until five six. I'm actually I'm not sure if the presentation is uh, on online right now, as I am speaking on the phone. Uh, however, uh, today we're here to express our concerns for uh, CCS and the safety of young riders. And yeah, so uh, I am a grade nine uh, student, and I am going into high school next year. And I will be taking the LRT along with uh, my my friend Elizabeth Wells, and we are both going to be going to different parts of the city. And yes, yeah, so uh, our concern uh, this would be uh, a slide. Uh, sorry. So uh, Edmonton's largest issues right now. Uh, Obviously, we understand that there is a growing homeless population with not enough parking. So every day on my way to and from school, I see people sleeping along walls, stairways, and on benches. This activity happens in Clairview Station quite often in the early morning and during the night. All the, um, I'm not sure if you can see the photos, but uh, there were photos. Uh, we, we have uh, public use of drugs, which is another huge issue that has uh, been happening with the LRT. Uh, weapons are another concern, as uh, there are uh, videos embedded in the slideshow that we were supposed to present. Uh, but then uh, we also have behaviors. So uh, on the LRT, I have witnessed many behaviors, such as swearing, screaming, yelling, and abusive, abusive property. Uh, and these are all regular occurrences that I see on the LRT station. So uh, another huge one is cleanliness. Uh, cleanliness goes along with these behaviors of people because if people can get away with bad behavior, they're not going to care about keeping public transit clean and sanitary. So, um, uh, yeah, so that is a huge issue. Uh, another issue we have is enforcing laws. Uh, there are many people who believe that riding the LRT is free because there's never anyone around to check for proof of payment. So this makes for an unfair system where people who are abiding by the laws are being disrespected and punished by individuals who are not respecting the rules. So this makes me question the effect that laws have on our city's inhabitants. Does anybody care enough to follow the rules if punishment seems minimal? Overall, these are the main reasons why EPS users are uncomfortable, frustrated, and fed up with the EPS and LRT system. Uh, so, so now I'm going to uh, also uh, give some specifics. Uh, uh, actually, I'm going to be uh, passing on to uh, Elizabeth Fowles. Uh, okay. Uh, okay. Uh, okay. Okay. So, hi. Well, I will be speaking from now until slide 16. According to the city of Edmonton's very own website, we can clearly see the decline in riders since January 2020. Now, we can understand that the COVID-19 pandemic has been in the middle of that. However, when we compare ridership from before the pandemic to the most recent point on the graph, the numbers don't even come close to what they once were. Many riders have expressed how, due to many of the issues that have occurred on transit, they are more likely to stick with personal transportation rather than taking the LRT. Can I say next slide? In response to, to public safety concerns on June 9, 2022, the city, the city launched Edmonton Downtown, Downtown Core and Transit System Safety Plan with a focus on downtown, including Chinatown and transit spaces. The plan outlines 16 actions to support and strengthen the safety of Edmontonians. The city has also mentioned $8.4 million from, for police funding to go towards solving issues. As much as the city has done so far to try and make their system safer for all, all riders, there are still things that can be done to help. Examples include increasing funding overall, responses, responses to the homelessness population at encampments, 
tidying and cleaning stations slash trains, increasing, um, increasing peace officer presence, a major response to needles, drugs, and the ongoing opioid problem, and amendments to the city to the conduct of transit riders bylaw. In May 2022, the MSA Police Services started phase one of Project Connection with, the, with focus on increased police visibility in Alberta Avenue, Chinatown, and, and the downtown core and transit system. As shown on the slide, these are some initiatives that are to contribute to making Edmonton a safer city. Yeah. Hi there, uh, this is uh, Pat Carrier again. Um, okay, so before our meeting here today, uh, me and Lizzie presented our concerns uh, around our school, and we have a few statistics. Uh, so, uh, uh, as we have seen, uh, uh, Half of students that we asked, uh, we had a Google form where we asked 145 students, age 11 to 15 years of age, uh, how they were feeling about the transit system. And uh, and yes, so um, this this uh, system, sorry, uh, this system here uh, was uh, there to uh, see how uh, young riders were feeling. And uh, over half of students said that they felt unsafe on our LRG system due to uh, concerns over violence, uh, public drug use, and also our homeless population. And uh, yes, so um, I think I may be running out of time. So uh, our main our main goal uh, that we want to present is uh, the turnstiles. And uh, if the slideshow is uh, is playing, it's probably a few slides down. Uh, but anyway, yeah, so we would like to uh, propose the idea of setting up some turnstile gates. And uh, we think that this would be very, very helpful uh, to protect uh, all riders, but especially our youth riders. And uh, yeah, so uh, overall, our main purpose today was to try and present and of course, we had some technical difficulties, but um, yes. Uh, so, uh, thank you so much for this opportunity. Uh, I'm, I know I apologize for uh, the the loud noises and and things, uh, but we uh, maybe another time uh, the counselors could maybe just look at our slideshow and maybe read our script. Uh, so we were a bit more planned, but uh, yes. Uh, overall, that's that's what we have to say. No, I, uh, I appreciate it. Thank you so much for your time today. And I will confirm that all council members, including administration, received a copy of the PDF of your presentation. So uh, we did receive it and we can review it. So thank you very much for that and your interest in civics. Uh, I'll look to the okay. committee members now if they have any questions for you. I see uh, Mayor Sohi. First of all, uh, Casey and Elizabeth, thank you so much for your presentation and all the research that you have done uh, in preparation to the presentation. I hope that uh, uh, other people take, uh, uh, you know, uh, guidance from you in a way that do that kind of research in order to uh, understand what is going on. So really appreciate all the hard work that you and your class uh, have put into it. Uh, and also share your concerns about safety. Uh, you identify a number of the things that we are, the steps we are taking. But I also want, want you to let you know that uh, we are also hiring more uh, transit security officers as well as more social workers. And they will work oh. together in a team and that team will not only enforce what needs to be enforced, but also they will uh, connect uh, houseless population or other who need help. So they're connected to services and programs so that people can get access to uh, the support they need. Uh, I just wanna know if you're aware of that. Okay. Uh, any other questions or comments? No, that's that's the one thing I wanted to you know, 
another thing I want you to know that uh, we take your feedback very seriously and we take uh, our public transit service very seriously. Uh, another thing that I want you to know that uh, even though we have seen decline in the ridership because of pandemic, uh, we are very proud that the ridership is coming back and our ridership recovery is uh, higher than any other municipality in Canada. So we are doing what we can to make the system safer for you and, uh, and future riders that you, are, you feel comfortable using and you feel safe using the transit system. Okay. Okay. No, thank you so much thank for your you. your input. Thank okay. you so much. Yeah. Uh, am I uh, good to leave the meeting now? Uh, if you must, I do have one other counselor who has a question for you. Okay, sorry. Uh, yes, uh, please go ahead. Okay, Councillor Tang, if you can be quick. They're on a field trip. Uh, okay, great. Thank you both very much for um, being so civically engaged and bringing such a 33 page slideshow. It's very comprehensive and also for engaging your fellow classmates. Um, I guess first I want, I'm, I'm curious about your answer because I didn't actually hear your answer to Mr. Mayor's question about if you are aware of those um, uh, implementation of our community outreach transit teams um, that, you know, that really serves this function that, that, that you were kind of describing coupling um, peace officers with social workers. Um, and if you are aware of the trends because uh, I see you've done a lot of research, uh, the trends in ridership coming back. Yes. Okay, uh, so, so go ahead. Oh, uh, sorry, you go ahead first. Oh no, I'm just wondering if you have an answer to that or if, if you came across those pieces in your research. Uh, so we came across uh, all, of our, um, all of our research uh, by uh, going into uh, what the city had on their website, and uh, yeah, so uh, for the for the ridership, that is the most recent graph that we had found. And uh, uh, sorry, um, and may you just uh, please uh, remind me of the, uh, the question again? Sorry. Um, yeah, and and so he just expressed that in fact our ridership has you know steadily um, increased. Uh, we're now at over seventy percent of pre-pandemic levels, and that's significant. And it helps us with some of these planning that you've highlighted. I guess for me uh, personally, I'm curious in your conversations with your peers, with your classmates. Um, You've noted that there's a lot of issues with homelessness and the social disorder you've seen. Have you all talked a little bit amongst yourself about, you know, why are things the way they are? Um, uh, yes. So um, we we have been talking about that, and uh, this also uh, something I'm pretty sure is in the slideshow uh, in some point. Uh, so about the homeless uh, population, uh, while while me and Elizabeth were. Uh, going around our classes, uh, students came up with um, those questions of how did, um, you know, how did this happen? How did it get like this? And, you know, why are there so many homeless people? And uh, yes, so uh, we understand that shelters are uh, at a very max out rate at the moment. And um, there's lots of homeless people who don't have any place to go. So, um, we, we understand why everything is the way that it is, but um, our only, uh, our main purpose today was to try and um, give a few ideas of how um, we could maybe help the homeless by maybe building more shelters and maybe, um, maybe even uh, developing a program where they could get uh, access to uh, safe, safe drug sites and also uh, safe, um, uh, safe housing. Yeah, uh, you know and, what? I think um, I think your presentation is very timely because we've been talking about all these issues that you're talking about uh, for the last many uh, many weeks. And uh, in fact, a lot of the the items, the suggestions you had, uh, you know, we're actively working on them. And I'll be very curious down the road uh, to see to hear from you whether you think there has been some incremental changes uh, and improvements. Um, you know, I know that you know some of these things are being implemented now. Um, my last question for you is, I'm curious if you're connected in at all with the city's uh, youth council. 
Um, sorry, uh, can you please repeat that? I'm, I'm curious if you and your friends are, are, are connected at all with Edmonton's Youth Council? Um, we are we are not a part of the Edmonton Youth Council. Uh, we're uh, so pretty much how how our presentation started is that we how we we were experiencing uh, these things on transit, and then we just decided to go about it uh, on our own. So uh, again, uh, we're from John DeBracco School in Northeast Edmonton. So uh, we're yeah, we just kind of started independently. Yeah, no, that's good, and I think um, I, I I think potentially that you might be interested in your in your research and presentation as well. So I'm just flagging this for Councillor Jans here, who is uh, sitting on that. Um, and I also think you know uh, a connection in with our ETS team and um, to to learn more about what you know what are we doing. Um, but a separate opportunity will be will potentially be helpful. But thank you so much for coming in. I was really impressed with your presentation. Thank you so much. Sir, uh, Kat, is, is there any uh, yes, there's further one, questions? There is. There's uh, uh, one or two more. Um, uh, Council Wright. Okay. Hi, Cassie and Elizabeth. I'm, I know you're on a field trip and I'll let you get to it. I, I just wanted to know if, if you and your classmates were aware that um, Mayor Sohi has also been working with the province advocating on behalf of, of helping our, our homeless population. Um, helping uh, to try to get funding for shelters and other affordable housing. Were you, were you aware uh, of those yes. initiatives? Yes, so uh, how, how uh, we became aware of this, uh, uh, actually it was during this uh, uh, meeting a little bit and uh, on the global news, uh, I saw a bit, a, a bit of uh, things where uh, Mayor Sophie was uh, explaining how he wanted to help the houseless population and uh, yes, so we we were just recently made uh, made aware of this. Okay, and well, we are very very grateful. Okay, good. I just I just wanted to to know that that he's working for all of us here. So, um, thank you very much. Um, great presentation. Thank you for your engagement. Um, and I will echo uh, Councillor Tang's suggestion that you might want to look at the uh, Edmonton Youth Council, and um, okay. enjoy enjoy your summer. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Mayor Sohi? No, no, I just want to give them a round of applause for all the hard work you've done. Yep. Okay, thank you. Thank you to our guests again. And uh, we certainly, um, though your ward councillor, Councillor Paquette, is not uh, a member of this committee, uh, we would certainly encourage you in following up with, with him and working with him going forward in your, in your education journey. So thank you. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And now, uh, just maybe if i if i may one more uh thing Please. Uh, i know this is the city and council committee uh so we would really really uh like to maybe get into uh meet with council members another time maybe in the summer or just you know to kind of help you guys maybe out a yeah. little bit too and just kind of give more voices so uh we would really appreciate if maybe uh our ward leader aaron paquette would be able to uh review our slideshow yeah, I'll look to the clerk that we can connect you with him in his office and his email. So uh, thank you very much. With that, we conclude questions of the speaker. We now move to questions of administration. Uh, I invite our guests to depart to their excitement. And I look to members of the committee who have questions for administration. I believe, Mayor Sohi, you selected this item. You can go first. Yeah, thank you so much for all the hard work. Uh, I'm just trying to understand the... the uh, the intent of the motion was to create those joint teams under a tripartite uh, governance model, right? And what I see in the report is uh, is the uh, the different approach where you know EPS is the lead, and the social sector only gets involved at 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 stage three, right? So just want to get get a sense uh, about about that like why why is it the uh, why caught team is not the model uh, I mean it's a different approach because of different issues so I just want to understand if that I think my understanding of the emotion was not not that my it was more of a joint response you are correct 
I think the timing is what perhaps is confusing the response because when this motion was requested and then the time it took to come forward with it, right. a lot of things have happened in the intervening time. And so it, there's sort of a, a, a confluence of activity, not either or, but and. And so COT continues, engagement with the social agencies continues. And in response to the tragedies that happened in Chinatown, Project Connection was a very specific uh, response that was about um, a, a visible presence in, in phase one, uh, and then working with more intentionally different areas of the, of the city and communities yeah. uh, to inform that response, and then phase three talking about sustainability based on the evidence of, of impact. Yeah. So that enforce, I understand the enforcement aspect of it, right? But the, we already start hearing from um, other community businesses and members and the leaders that the consequences of enforcement now people are being pushed out into uh, into Alberta Avenue or 107th Avenue or into uh, into Strathcona uh, area, right? So I think enforcement may help with kind of a stabilizing the situation. Uh, yeah, so I'm mean, just trying to understand that aspect. And also, uh, council approved another motion about using the $5 million from the province for public safety that we, we got from them. Maybe we, we need to think about integration of this into that report in a way that we are able to achieve the outcomes that the, the motion was intended to do, which was a joint uh, collaborative approach of enforcement and social workers. Potentially, uh, Mr. Mayor, we're working with the province right now on how to allocate that $5 million. It is from their Jobs, Economy, and Innovation yeah. uh, Ministry, and so uh, we're working on areas in which the city can fund that using part. those dollars. Yeah, okay. All right. That's, that's, uh, that's the only thing I've, I know this is an information report, I understand, but the intent was to expand COT beyond transit into the community and have that uh, uh, joint groups working together. Certainly, and, and uh, as we do our recruitment for our peace officers that is currently underway, and as uh, Bend Arrow continues to recruit for their social workers, yeah. recognizing that um, the social sector is stretched, uh, we are um, trying to uh, increase our capacity so that we have a greater impact. Okay, good, no, thank you. If I, could, if I could just elaborate on the, the conversations that we had uh, with the Edmonton Police Service, um, we do acknowledge that uh, while we had caught uh, in the transit system, um, the Edmonton Police Services Help uh, Unit is, is working sort of outside of the transit system in a lot of these same spaces. And so we didn't want to duplicate resources and duplicate, um, you know, work that had been done by the different agencies. And so we've made sure that those two teams are talking at an operational level uh, to make sure that we're not kind of creating redundancies in the system as we all try to collaborate for all of these different issues. No, thank you for that, I, and, and, and I understand and appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, thank you, thank you, Councillor Jans, for filling in for me. Uh, next is Councillor Tang. Great, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so, I guess first I, I wanted to ask, because I know this motion is very specific to specific areas in the core, um, but, you know, as we've also heard from the students, uh, you know, they're on the north side and, and I certainly heard lots of concerns to Century Park and south side. And I'm curious at all if there are any conversations among your teams about measures beyond the core at all at this point. Sorry, could you just repeat the last part of your sentence? You faded away on me. Sorry. Uh, if there's any conversations at all, you know, I'm not, I'm not looking for any concrete actions, but any conversations about, um, you know, measures beyond the core. Well, I know that when there was the return to the workplace for um, office workers in the downtown, uh, we did surge our presence in the transit spaces uh, to. Um, have a greater visibility. We've done that same thing for the U of A and, and, and our uh, coverage during the commute also uh, is during the same time of, of school commutes. So um, 
we are, we, we try to respond to those trends and, and those increases in ridership at different times during the day in different places in the city. Again, capacity continues to be an issue that we are grappling with. Uh, I'm not sure yeah, if David okay. wants to add anything. Yeah, I think what I would say, um, and thanks very much for this question, is while we know this motion was specific to a, a, a smaller area, both the the teams from the city as well as from the Edmonton Police Service that meet on a on a regular frequency uh, from like an operational leadership perspe perspective, uh, they're representing citywide resources uh, and citywide units who are really trying to tackle issues uh, uh, across that entire space. Uh, and I think we do have a number of overlapping motions right now. The one that's coming forward to council on Monday about the Healthy Streets Operation Center. We're, we're really looking at expanding Kind of the work that we've already been doing um, uh, in the in that shared work as well as the operation connection from the EPS uh, and, and looking at how we could expand that model to be larger than what is talked about in this and how we could expand it to the greater community overall I think so yeah no, these, are all, these are all sort of iterative processes but uh, but certainly it, it, the teams that are involved are the ones that are kind of tasked citywide with some of these issues yeah, that's great. That's kind of what I was um, hoping to hear that you're you are having this citywide conversation. And I'll be curious, and not necessarily now, but you know later on, uh, any hotspot data coming up on the north side and south side, um, you know, Clearview Century Park, uh, just as we heard. Um, and so, just so I'm 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 clear then. Um, so we we are we're we're anticipating hiring to be done, and we're gonna have seven. Cot teams, right? In place, yes. Okay. Yeah, that's correct. Um, okay. uh, the transit peace officers will be ready in the next couple of weeks. The expression of interest is out um, as the uh, as the uh, the induction training uh, that um, Mr. Laman mentioned earlier uh, yeah. wraps up. We'll be able to uh, kind of replace uh, the more experienced officers. Will be going to uh, the cot teams and. Uh, right. Fresh folks will be, you know, headed in with field training officers to the rest of the uh, rest of the the system, as it were. So, so we're we're just we're kind of looking at a couple months of um, of deployment of resources, and and then these teams are also coordinated with you know our partner sectors uh, with a help, like you say, and potentially other kinds of outreach teams. And um, I see this reference here to the mutual aid one. Um, and I understand that report is coming a little bit in August, uh, and there's no direction on that. Um, but I, I, I'm, I'm curious if it's referenced here because there is interest. Um, I think the, um, if I can, uh, Councillor, the, the reference there is just how sort of uh, complex. I mean, in the. In the transit systems, things are a little bit more contained, and we have very specific roles uh, out in the, the 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 broad world where there's a mix of private facilities and public establishments and public spaces. Um, we're looking at a lot more of a complex infrastructure yeah. or uh, ecosystem, uh, and so that the the mention of that is just to, uh, as a reminder that you know that work continues. There's lots of different pieces of work that can continues. From the transit safety report in February, obviously the um, the outreach coordinator is not specific to transit. The goal of that was to take a look at that that broader ecosystem with respect to all of the outreach teams that are working and making sure that you know we have the best possible alignment we can through that entire um, you know support system that we have. Excellent. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Wright. Thank you very much. Um, Ms. Flamin, I just want to let you know it's in my calendar for July 12th to attend the graduation. I attended the one in December as well. Um, but I'm just wondering, are we, are we in a net positive of peace officers? I'm just wondering if we've, we've you know, not lost any, but, um, you know, if there's some on disability because of trauma and, and what they've experienced over the past year or two. So I know that there was a memo that was sent that uh, broke down some of the... Uh, the long-term disability and, and whatnot for different areas. But you know, are we at net? Like we are always, people are always moving through their careers. 
and um, enforcement uh, is challenging. And so um, by hiring these 10 peace officers, there are still more that need to get hired. So we have not arrived. At, at where we need to be or want to be, okay. I was just wondering because, you know, the, the ladies from, uh, or the students from the, the school were indicating that they hadn't really seen any increased presence in that. And so any new ones that we are getting are, are mainly focused on the downtown um, or? Well, there's gonna be a whole deployment that is going to respond to hotspots and to our, our data. Um, and we need more, okay. and, and part of that will be part of the 2326 uh, funding packages that will be coming to Council for your review. Okay, okay. look forward to seeing that. Thank you. Uh, I guess that goes to me. So, Council Wright, would you take the chair, please? No? Oh, there he is, okay. So, sorry, I'm trying to get lunch. Um, my Councillor Jans. Uh, Thank you. So I guess my, my question is about displacement. Um, I'm hearing a lot about folks crossing the river and coming up to White Ave and the south side. Um, what are we going to do about that? I think we always knew that displacement was going to be um, an issue and a concern. And um, I think everyone's trying to respond as humanely as possible and connecting folks wherever they are with the services that they may require to to help them in the place that they're at. I know it's not a very fulfilling response. May I ask about in the report, it notes there's a, uh, I just wanna get the wording right here. Um, the provincial government's coordinated community response pilot program, does this, could you elaborate on that? I'll pass it over to Mr. Jones. Uh, so there, uh, thanks very much for the question, Councillor. Uh, there are a number of teams, um, uh, primarily from community services that uh, have been meeting with um, a working group of that um, provincial action team or provincial task force. Um, and we've been looking at uh, different models. I think the idea was to have um, some different models uh, being rolled out. And, and largely what, uh, what we've been doing with respect to um, encampment response uh, has, um, has included what we're hearing from that team, but I'd suggest that we're also able to contribute on a provincial level to some suggestions that maybe haven't been um, considered anywhere else. Uh, so it's, it's been a bit of a, a, a mutual learning. Um, my understanding is that that work uh, has now wrapped up with that, um, that provincial uh, subcommittee. But uh, the, the players who are uh, sitting on those are, are ones that we're, as, as the professionals, we're meeting on a regular basis anyways. And uh, we're plugged into a number of the community folks who have, uh, who have contributed to that to those meetings as well. Uh, so the work continues, the conversations continue, uh, even if that um, sort of that uh, table, if you will, has wrapped up. Appreciate that. I, I, I think administration can appreciate that this is a, a, uh, a major area of interest for this council, given our budget constraints, given the, the safety concerns that have come up, the disorder concerns that have come up. And there's a couple of pieces here that I, I would like to hear more about. And, evaluation of COT, the governance model of the multidisciplinary teams, the uh, differences, the pros and cons, advantages, disadvantages between the multidisciplinary disciplinary teams versus the COT teams, the resource requirements, et cetera. And I feel like we, instead of going three or four rounds today, um, I would look to the chair, I would like to put a motion to refer it down. So I'm not sure if I could do that here at committee or yeah, you can re you can move a motion to or or make a motion to refer it back. To Thank it you. Then, yep. yeah, there's a, and I want to obviously couch this in appreciation for what's being done and and ongoing. But uh, just to get a little bit more to the, I think the intent of this motion um, initially or a, a intent of the inquiry initially. So I would like to m move a referral back to administration for further detail, including evaluation of COT, proposed governance model of multidisciplinary teams 
differences slash advantages between multidisciplinary teams and COT, resource requirements for COT versus multidisciplinary teams, and I'm just going to put this in the chat to the clerk. Is that in order? Yep, that's in order. Uh, motion is on the floor, so I can take questions on the motion or on the report to admin as well. We're at committee. Um, any more to introduce it, Councillor Gents? That's it. Okay, Councillor Stevenson. Yeah, thank you, and uh, thanks to the mover for putting this on the floor. I think I think it captured some of the questions that I had lingering from this. I I appreciate this this tricky position that we're in, where this motion, um, the initial motion that generated this report, uh, was done um, under different circumstances, and and I. I think that we risk continuing to be in this reaction mode um, and there's actually a, an opportunity to step back and really think about this model COT that we developed that I think is, is a really exciting one. Um, and for me, I think the real innovation with COT was that uh, governance structure. And so, you know, before we move away from that, I think it's important for us to just understand, you know, what, what worked, uh, what didn't work. So to, to wrap this into a question um, is is that work I think I heard underway in terms of evaluating caught kind of doing you know what worked what hasn't been working we are always evaluating but um, caught's only been a thing for a couple of months and so uh, in terms of like lessons learned uh, we need more time to see it grow and uh, what it looks like when we have uh, a greater cadre doing that work and the impact that it has. We are certainly tracking um, outputs right now, like number of interactions, um, some great anecdotal narratives and stories of impact, which are, you know, make my heart very warm. Um, and and I, I completely believe in evaluation to determine efficacy. And so uh, with this motion and this work or for information that people are asking for, absolutely am happy to do it. We we'll just ask for a little bit of time so that we can let this, the program run a little bit so that instead of the usual 13 week turnaround, I would seek uh, a greater amount of time to be able to properly evaluate. Yeah, thanks for that. I mean, I think, I think the, the timing challenge for us is um, you know, really comes down to that last point around the resource requirements uh, for the different approaches. And when, as we're going into budget, I think that, you know, we'll, we'll need a bit of clarity around that in terms of where, where we're choosing to invest and what sort of the model moving forward. Um, but maybe, maybe, Mr. Jones, if you could speak to, again, the multidisciplinary community safety teams you know, none of those words are bad words. I think that's the, 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 the way we want to be moving towards, what we want to be moving towards, absolutely. Just wondering if there have been conversations around, yeah, what that governance model is, who the, who the folks are coming to the table. Um, yeah, how, what, what have the, been the conversations to date? Yeah, thank you for the question. And I think um, we have to consider that we're still growing what this looks like and who might be coming to the table to participate uh, in these teams. And so um, what will be, you know, in, initially uh, some of the public safety organizations, the Edmonton Police Service, uh, obviously different uh, areas of the city will be participating in these. And then, um, you know, looking for those additional community partners as we go. Uh, certainly uh, the governance right now, it depends on which teams we're looking at. COT has a certain governance because we have a partnership with Pentaro uh, Traditional Healing Society. Um, you know, the, the, the joint efforts in transit uh, will uh, have their own style of governance and oversight and uh, anything that we do out in the community. I know, um, as I mentioned, we've got the, the Healthy Streets Operations Center uh, report coming uh, for next week at Council. and. And, and those multidisciplinary teams, each one is going to be uh, a little bit different depending on what it is that they're trying to address uh, in that collaborative way out in the community. And so those teams will have, um, you know, some, some visible presence with respect to enforcement, but also look at problem-oriented uh, practices and, and sort of changing environments or uh, situations so that, uh, you know, we don't have people being victimized out on the street yeah. uh, or in different areas. And so, um, you yeah. know, this one's complex because we have the ongoing work with the Transit Safety Initiative that uh, 
you know, that we're bringing sort of routine updates for. We've got uh, the COT uh, pilot project, but also it's linked to that same report. Um, so there's a lot of different work getting done all in the, the public safety sphere that, that um, you know, has some overlapping in the, in the report. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And I think, I think that overlap um, is challenging, you know, also re recognizing that, that we did have, you know, some need for some very immediate responses. Uh, but I think it's really, you know, building on something that we've already created, which is caught. And again, if there are that evaluation, I think will highlight, you know, if there are gaps there. But I think really building on that that governance model is an exciting proposition. Thank you. Um, so wondering about Q3 for a timeline, which implies by end of September, would that be an, a good balance between enough time and? And yeah. I can leave that with you. The for first a bullet might be tough. Um, yeah, if you can take out the first bullet for, for September, then we have a better chance of, or if you're okay for like iterative or point in time. Um, uh, well, um, so I'll leave this with you and we'll go to Councillor Tang. If you want to say Q4, but just I'm kind of thinking it would be the early end of Q4 to allow conversations ahead of budget is all. Certainly, and just trying to balance that. Yeah, yeah, for sure. No, I can appreciate that. Okay, I'll come back in a second. Uh, Councillor Tang. Yeah, I. I guess first to the mover. Uh, what was the timeline you were thinking of? Yeah, I think I think Q three is good. So my my intention here is that I'm really thinking ahead to the budget kind of like yeah. the, the crisis response motion and everything else. So I'm yeah. working back from budget. What do we need to yeah. do? To I can, yeah, I can appreciate that for sure. And I, I, I just have one more question um, for you. When you say evaluation, is there any specific evaluation you're looking at? I, I'm not sure how to answer that again, either than going back to return on investment sort of for, for um, impact and what we're, yeah. what we are trying to accomplish in line with our, our broader well safety and well being safer for all yeah. goals. Okay. I, I, I will have a number of concerns about, about this motion. I think, you know, we, uh, I think we're struggling to fill the role. Hiring is a concern. Capacity is a concern. We haven't even fully deployed all of our resources yet to roll this out um, and to do, you know, that kind of, that level of impact evaluation, I don't think we're gonna get the answer we're gonna want uh, to inform any kind of budget decision, you know. And for the governance model, um, I feel like if, again, this is just rolling out and we don't even know yet, I think it's way too soon to kind of jump to that. I can understand why we will want this information to inform our decision making. So I guess my question to administration, you know, we get regular updates about transit safety through memos. We get regular updates about encampment. Um, is referral the, the best mechanism here, especially since you're doing these kinds of iterative, evaluative work? Um, I can see, you know, the especially bullet three is might be, you know, might be doable within that timeline, but I'm just very concerned about staff capacity. And I'm worried that we're not gonna get the kind of evaluation we're expecting to truly make that decision well. Yeah. Could I offer that when we come to budget for 23-26, any ask that we're coming with is going to come with pieces of impact and our best advice based on the information that we have. So I'm not gonna come to you with anything frivolous. I'm gonna come to you with things that from our lived experience, from the, from the research and the data that we've been able to collect to that point, that it will be as fulsome as it is and that we will bring forward our best advice for you um, because these are our people as well. You know, I don't want to deploy at a whim. I don't want to uh, make people do things that aren't productive. And so um, perhaps if there would be some patience with us in those unfunded or those, those service packages that will come as part of budget, that as much as possible, we would infuse that work with this information. Sorry, and to me, that feels like a much more feasible approach and maybe we can get a memo on bullet three. I think I would just worry about a motion here that sets up certain expectation for the kind of information that is just, that's like, you don't do ROI evaluation within like a three month period. 
we just don't. And you're not gonna get the kind of information that we're that the that this motion is intended to do. So I would um so I so at this point I won't be able to support the motion, but I would be very supportive of what Ms. Fun had outlined uh, with those um unfunded service package. And I'm very conscious of how this ties with so many other things that we have going on the go right now. Um, if anything, I will be looking for, uh, you know, a wholesome, um, I guess, presentation about kind of the impact for, for how all those things work in, in conjunction with one another. Okay, thank you. Councillor Wright. Um, thank you. I was going to propose a friendly amendment for the word evaluation and maybe just interim evaluation, but I, I think I like uh, Ms. Slamman's suggestion as far as making sure that this information is provided in the, um, in the budget request that comes forward. Right. So I, I don't think I can support this motion, but we'll, we'll support having this information coming back with the, the budget cycle. Thank you, uh, Councillor Chance. Thank you, I'll, I'll withdraw the motion. And I have another question. Go ahead with your question. So uh, I'm looking at the, sorry, I'm trying to find the citation here, but the note about, um, and I'll quote, uh, stakeholders in Chinatown indicated that several of the current pressures may be an impact of current provincial and federal discharge and release processes from the health system and criminal justice system without confirmed accommodation. So this to me says it's something that, you know, we as the city can't easily fix that. Um, this is a, uh, as a, you know, as we've learned from recent tragedies, this, this has an enormous impact on our work yet is sort of out of our hands. So, I'm, I'm wondering if administration could comment on that or what we're hearing back through various tables or channels, um, especially in the last few weeks. I can share that um, our city manager who sits on this uh, coordinated community response to homelessness task force, that this has been a topic of conversation. I'm not privy to that final report and when it comes forward, but I know that um, there seems to be a broad understanding of the opportunity that um, is available in response to this gap. And I note um, in later on there's talk uh, about the, in the CCRH task force, there's multiple working groups and in reference and sort of to my earlier question about um, the provincial pilot regarding homelessness, I'm just wondering because, and maybe this is my confusion here, but we have the COT teams, we're now adding multidisciplinary teams. There's also this provincial team for homelessness. And, and I guess I'm a little confused, um, though I hear my colleague's point about the mid-evaluation and can certainly stop that, but which is the best, which is the best approach? What are the pros and cons of, of each? I don't know if that's an easier question we can resolve now. It actually is. So <laughs> I feel so apt right now as opposed to inept. Um, the pilots that are being done by the province are two, one in Lethbridge and one in Edmonton. And one in Edmonton was specifically focused on Chinatown. What Mr. Jones was alluding to is that that last meeting that a, a number of us attended uh, was the end of the provincial lead, but just now smooths into a um, multidisciplinary, multi-agency um, coordinated response. So it, it's, a, it's a beautiful warm handoff uh, to having uh, the province lead a conversation and bring people together and uh, in, in two cities and then the city itself with the different agencies agreeing like yes this let's keep moving forward on this and so there isn't a duplication it is simply a um, I guess a handoff and, and a commitment to continue to work the problem and I'm, I'm sorry if I'm a little low caffeine is the is the the feeling we're gonna move caught teams just to transit keep them 100 meters within transit. Mul these new multidisciplinary teams will be on the ground and then EPS also has their help teams. Uh, are, are, we, are we trying to refocus, is, is part of this multidisciplinary approach to refocus COT back to transit? I think COT has always been transit. So then we're adding these multidisciplinary teams 
And and that the idea would be they then take over Chinatown, Alberta Ave, White Ave hotspots. That's right. So COT is going to be will uh, maintain its focus in the transit spaces, and then recognizing the success that that uh, that partnership has had in the transit spaces, we are duplicating that partnership with other agencies um, in different spaces, like you've just alluded to. Okay, and so we conceivably could see service packages for all of these. I don't know about, well, yes, as, as we need more resources to be more impactful, yes, you will, you will uh, receive those packages as part of the budget conversation. Yeah, and I just need to understand the, the governance model a little bit too because it mentioned in one of the reports, like, it, no, one, no one organization is responsible for it, right? Um, so I'm just wondering who, can, like, who is or who is not, right? So like. Uh, you know, and sure, fair question. So we are all working through uh, what that looks like. It is going to be matrix. Will there be one throat to choke? Uh, pick mine. Uh, but I think it's it's going to be um, a true collaboration when you've got different authorities and different agencies working together. It is messy. It is not black and white. And is in that, in that nuanced gray that we have to muddle our way through. And um, you just have my personal commitment that whatever I can do to create clarity in those working relationships, I will do. And and certainly I, pre I appreciate that. And, and um I, I just want to make sure at the end of the day we are resourcing everything appropriately and, and that, that for me is I, I can't unsee budget from here and I'm just sort of again working back from that. So it's not a, it's not a, 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 a blame game, it's a, a how, do we, how do we pay the bill and, and which bill first, that's, that's all. So I apologize if my questions were uh, uh, it, it offensive to anyone on, on the call. I, do, I certainly don't mean to uh, suggest any of this is frivolous, it's very, very important. Um, but do, uh, yeah, I just want to make sure that at the end of the day that, that you know, we have the, the right time, right call, et cetera, going forward. Absolutely. And no offense was taken. Perfect. Um, Thank you. And I'm deeply committed to accountability and responsibility. So please know that too. Uh, Councillor Stevenson. Thanks, Councillor Carmel. I guess, yeah, I guess I'm still struggling in terms of, again, assessing which, which model makes, makes more sense. So I think in terms of sort of evaluating where COD is, for me, that sort of understanding what works and what doesn't work about it, and if that's the model that we want, want to grow from. So I guess I just worry by leaving this to budget, I'm just not clear how we have that conversation about which model makes the most sense. I don't think it's either or. I think again, it's that and. So I think that well, there. Yeah, and I mean, I think I think the concern there though is like even just recognizing caught. I think um, I think concerns have been raised around uh, you know even just like transit peace officers being limited to transit. I think that we were we were wanting to reduce the sort of um, very specific geographical jurisdiction of different safety teams, right, to allow better coordination and and uh, collaboration. So again, I just, I, I just feel like we're creating a patchwork now of different models, different governance approaches, different jurisdictional, you know, so I, I, I struggle with that. May um, I respond to just that one point? Because agreed, and we, we have unions that, uh, and authorities that require us to have different folks in different places of employment. So we are working within those constraints, uh, which is also part of the equation that is complex. But again, I feel like the idea with COT was, was you know, taking a model and expanding it out, uh, which I think is, is really valuable in terms of that iterative understanding and learning. Whereas now, again, it just sort of seems we're gonna have this model here, we'll have this model here. And again, how do we assess the cost of that, the, the efficacy of those different models uh, when we're making resource decisions at, at budget? I think if I may, Councillor, uh, whereas COT was created for a very specific issue that we were dealing with in transit, it, it may not be the solution in other locations. And so what we're suggesting is if some of the major players in public safety ecosystem come together, have a joint team that's going to work together in whatever the hotspot is uh, of that time, they also are able to refer back each into their own organization. So whereas, um, you know, right now we're focusing in Chinatown. It may be a different area uh, of, of the city in two years from now. 
But if we have a way of always working together with a joint team that is able to hit the ground, identify problems, have the same training, have some of the same language, and then be able to say, do you know what we need here? We need to be able to plug into the city's problem properties team. They will be able to do those direct referrals. Or, hey, what the issue is in this, t in this occasion is a gangs and guns issue. Well, then the EPS members in that, in that team can plug into the gangs and guns of the EPS and really sort of rally that larger ecosystem and public safety at the right time and the right place. And Councillor Stevenson, if I, if I might add, what administration will do is we'll bring a four-year service package forward that'll scale. And then just a reminder, through that budget process, there'll be supplementary budget adjustments that will allow Council to make changes uh, in, uh, in funding um, as the evaluation is complete and as we learn more. So there'll be, uh, it's not after the four-year budget cycles uh, pass that this is finished. This is going to be an ongoing conversation with council every single budget adjustment Thank you uh, So I've lost track of which rounds we're on however um, uh, I'll I will start the next round and I will start because there's not a motion on the floor by moving receipt of information of this report and To just very briefly introduce it. Uh, I think we've heard that uh, there is a lot of moving parts and a lot of parallel strategies and a lot of uh, actions that we hope will be complementary in this space, both this geographical space and in this realm of trying to provide the supports that uh, our most vulnerable neighbours need. I think we're also hearing that two things I heard over the last two days. One is that it takes time to evaluate the effectiveness of the various strings in this collection of this bundle of this cable of strategies and it's not going to be perfect uh, it's going to take some time to act miss fail and act again and the only cure for that is time the other thing I've heard is we must stop this significant number of parallel lines of reporting and these feedbacks of reports that lead to reports that lead to reports that all sit in parallel along that spectrum because that is consuming a lot of the resources that we would like to actually put to the work. So I really suggest that we give admin a little time to breathe, to act, to evaluate and to come back with some advice after a reasonable period of time to provide the advice we need going into the four-year budgets. Um, being trapped in this room isn't helping that. So motion on the floor, questions on the motion or to admin. Councillor Tang. Yeah, thank you. I was I was going to put it for uh, information as well, but you, you beat me to it. Uh, and for a lot of the similar reasons, I know we're where many of us are impatient for for results uh, because you know there is that public pressure um, for, to see immediate improvement, um, and I think we've heard from Ms. Wama earlier that that there are um, there are changes for sure. And I, I like to me like there's nothing to evaluate if the teams are not in place. And um, but I, I guess I do want to offer one thing, and I don't know if it's a subsequent or if it doesn't need anything um, that third bullet from earlier, the withdrawal motion around sort of this comparison of the different um, teams out there um, might potentially be a, a, a worthwhile. It's just a question of timing for me. When might that be, um, when might you have enough to kind of, uh, to be a pretty robust comparison? And also uh, this idea of, you know, I think will be helpful for the public and for council to know what's working, what's not working for for a cot, um, uh, some assumptions on my part, you know, if you're doing this iterative evaluation method, I'm assuming some form of developmental evaluation. And I'm wondering if in your regular transit safety update memos that comes out periodically, could there be a section that just, you know, like, what are we hearing this week? Because I, I like the format you have for the encampment where there was a section dedicated to addressing some of the things that came out of the motion I had made around 
uh, ethnographic research and prototyping. And I saw that there was a section dedicated to that. Uh, I'm wondering if, if, if that's doable um, just within the memos we're already getting uh, to kind of carve out a little bit of space to say, you know, what's been working for the last two week, weeks, how, how is our team adjusting, what, what are some key lessons learned, um, and what do we need to stop doing? You, you know, something kind of a, kind of a quick reflection. Um, I think that's a great idea, and we can certainly add uh, that information to the existing transit safety memos that you receive. Yeah, yeah, thank you. And then, do you have any thoughts on uh, that that third bullet from earlier? Uh, I think it was differences in comparison of multidisciplinary teams and COT, because I'm also thinking help, and you know, some of the ones there's a number of the ones that was brought up today. Can I have some more time to reflect on that, um, just to get a better sense from the team where we are on that journey before I respond? Is that okay? Sure. Yeah. Um, and for that, for that memo thing, I don't think you need direction. You, I think you can just do it. Is that right? Correct. We've already taken notes. We'll make that happen. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Stevenson. Yeah. Maybe firstly, just a, a quick question to the mover. So you would. You know, I really, I take your point around, uh, you know, generating reports for the sake of generating reports. But you mentioned, you know, potentially having the opportunity for admin to come back uh, and report in advance of the budget. So I'm just, I wasn't clear on the mechanism for that. Uh, well, I have not looked at the uh, items due list, but I have to imagine that this conversation is going to happen again sometime at committee between now and November. So by whatever means, or attached to whatever agenda item, we'll be able to have this conversation again. And failing that, administration can bring in a report. Yeah, are there are there related items on this coming forward? Mr. Jones, are you aware? Uh, well, I think even starting next week with the uh, Healthy Streets Operations Center, I think these, th this is a conversation that will continue through a number of different reports. Um, and, and, and we can start, we can, we can, I mean, we don't want to, we don't want to make reports completely unwieldy because this is a, this is a big topic and there are lots of different streams, but certainly, you know, the idea of w what team is the best team. And I think what we're trying to do, um, without giving <laughs> too many spoilers away for next week is really, uh, look at who is the core and, and how do we create uh, sort of ad hoc working teams based on specific issues or problem locations rather than creating a team, locking it in, having it march around uh, the city and maybe not being the right fit for whatever those issues are. So I think the idea is, is kind of coming up with what we need as a core to really um, explore public safety work in different ways uh, and then be responsive to the community needs rather than Right. Um, yeah, I think this kind of a process. Yeah, no, that's that's a really interesting idea of setting up a more responsive structure, fluid structure, rather than you know set models that that get get built out. So then, would it maybe? So that's a good point in terms of some of this coming up again next week in terms of the conversation around the the healthy streets initiative. So so perhaps to the mover, would you potentially anticipate? you know, that being an appropriate time to, to request some feedback in the fall in advance of budget about sort of like how all of those models have been working potentially. No. I think we've heard from administration that they are going to be presenting a lot of pertinent, detailed and in-depth information to inform a four-year budget conversation. I don't think we need to tell administration any more times, please bring us back a whole bunch of information so we can make good decisions. They don't need that direction from us. I, that is my view. Uh, and I am not going to support any more redundant motions for more reports. I won't. Here or at council. It's time to let our people get to work. This, this conversation started yesterday with a bundle of at least seven reports on seven not quite separate, rather overlapping motions. And the, the goal here was to get this gathered into one piece of work and advance one piece of work. So splitting off hairs, splitting off little pieces, and effectively 
almost directing the day-to-day -day work of administration through motions and reports is not effective. And it, and it leads to essentially report writing as opposed to work. So I won't support it. We've heard ad infinitum through these last two days. They know what they're doing. They're going and doing their work. They're gonna bring pertinent information back. I don't know what more we need to hear. Councillor Jans. Uh, I think, no, I was trying to remove myself. I think it's a hang, I think that's a, a hangover speak. Okay, seeing no more questions, please vote. Can I speak to the motion? Sure. Yeah, thank you uh, for the conversation today. Yeah, I look forward to further conversation around, around community safety. I think uh, the conversation on Monday will be great. I think for me what I'm responding to is that, you know, recent events have led to a very reactionary response. We are sort of addressing really significant community needs, which I, which I really support. I think, I think that enforcement centered approach has been needed and, and was what our community needed. I think for me, it's just thinking how, how we continue to evolve moving forward. And I think it's a governance question. I think it's the question that we were elected to do. Uh, that is the work that uh, is on our plate in terms of guiding governance and, and how our community comes together. So that's my interest and uh, that's what I hope we get through the further conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else caring to speak? Hearing none, please vote. Just looking for one more vote. It's not coming up for me. I'm a yes. Thank you. We have four votes. Please display the vote. That is carried. Takes us to item 9.1. Community Services Advisory Board request for direction. That is a private report, so I'll take a motion to move into private. I'll move that we go into private, subject to... Uh, section 17 and Sorry, can we just check if we actually need to go into private? Oh, okay. No, we don't need to. I Would you care to move the recommendation to nine point? Um, moving the recommendation provided in report for item 9.1. And that that remain private subject to section 17 and 24 of the Freedom of Information and Protection yes. of Privacy Act. Thank you. Very good. Please vote. It's on its way here. Me again? Oh, thank it's you. on its way. No, you're good. Perfect. Now we have four votes. Please display the vote. And that is carried. Thank you. Notices of motion. Councillor Tang. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I move that at the next uh, City Council meeting, July 4th, a motion for administration to work with the Edmonton Police Commission to present the 2021 Edmonton Police Services Annual Report um, in the fall, at a meeting in the fall prior to budget de deliberation. Thank you, I believe that's in order. So notice is received. Are there any other notices of motion? I have one, I'm just looking to my colleagues. Okay, bear with me while I find mine. So, uh, notice as follows. 
uh, at the July 4th City Council meeting, I will be moving the following motion, that administration provide a report that outlines, one, the opportunities and trade-offs for providing up to 100% of the incremental tax revenue to go towards the over-expenditures as defined in City Policy C-592, Industrial Infrastructure, Cost-Sharing Program for Over-Expenditures for Fulton Creek Business Park at 6010 30th Street Northwest in Edmonton, and two, any potential adjustments to City Policy C-592 and an engagement process to provide additional support for industrial development. I'll uh, fill you in on the pieces when we get to Council. Any other notices of motion? Any motions without customary notice? Thank you. We are adjourned.